will start. Uh, I will go back and forth between Turkish and English, and I will. I want to start in English um, uh, today. So we will uh, have a session on machine learning and deep learning, in particular uh, in distributed systems uh, and in um, uh, high performance uh, computing environments. And uh, my name is Mehmet Aktash. I'm a professor at Yildiz Technical University Computer Engineering Department. So I will be chairing today's uh, session. Uh, today we have uh, five different uh, papers. Um, uh, what we will be doing is that uh, we will uh, first um, uh, run uh, the videos of each presenter. And after that, uh, I will uh, give the audience a chance to ask uh, questions to the uh, presenter um, who, who is also in the session today. And the question answer session will be uh, live. Uh, you can post your questions uh, by using the chat um, uh, section uh, of the uh, Zoom environment. And uh, so if we can, so we can also give the uh, microphone to the uh, uh, uh, person who wants to ask the question. Okay, uh, I want to start with the first uh, paper. Uh, so let me uh, first uh, share the screen so that I can run the uh, related video. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, run the first presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Aryab Fatma and I'm a student at Ankara Yildirim Gazit University. I'm a computer engineering student uh, pursuing my master's. So today, as being one of the authors of this paper, I would like to present the paper to you. Uh, so the name of the paper is Comparison of Deep Hybrid Models and Basic Deep Models for Binary and Multi-Class Text Classification. So let's begin. So first off, let's start with what is text classification and what is the motivation for it. So text classification is a supervised task in natural language processing as it predicts and assigns the unstructured or unlabeled data to the most relevant uh, labels or classes uh, on the basis of context. So what is the motivation? So the modern world is data driven. The generation of complex data has increased. Internet is flooded with all sorts of textual data. The extraction of information from the data has helped many areas such as e-commerce, sentiment analysis, natural language inference, text or document categorization to grow. So text classification is used for the extraction of such information from bulky or complex data. And that's why it is an important and challenging task for researchers of today. classified text and some of the studies that use KNN for the classification of the text and some of the techniques combined two other two or more uh, machine learning algorithms uh, known as hybrid shallow approaches for example some of them used KNN and K means to classify Indonesian news and the others used KNN and SVM to be applied on text classification. So what we observed from the literature that traditional machine learning algorithms are capable of classifying text, but contain some shortcomings such as data sparsity, dimension explosion, and poor generalization. Mostly because um, the data is sometimes complex or the data has um, missing values or the data is too large to handle. So with further studies, we observed that deep learning algorithms 
when it comes to feature extraction have better learning ability and are more autonomous and they have a better prediction accuracy. Deep learning algorithms can are sophisticated when it comes to dealing with large or complex data. So we read some uh, algorithms in the literature of deep learning. So there was a study that uh, that had uh, text CNN, text RNN, and text RNN plus the attention technique. These three models were applied on SOHU news data set. And it was observed that text CNN, it was evaluated that uh, convolutional neural network is the most successful one among the other algorithms of deep learning. And the precision rate was 0 0.8534. And some other studies that use convolutional neural network, um, they proposed an approach that uh, automatically classify clinical text at the sentence level. And the, that uh, method, uh, their method outperformed other approaches at, the, at that time by 15%. And uh, then there was a study that used deep convolutional neural network architecture. And this was the first time when a deep neural network uh, was applied, a deep convolutional neural network was applied to text processing rather than the shallow one. So they got state-of-the-art results by using a 29-year convolutional neural network model. Their model was um, tested on eight different data sets. And what they achieved from their results is that on small data sets, their model performed, uh, their model had a little bad uh, results, uh, such as on AGN show data sets, and they get an 8.67% and 3.18 testing error, respectively. So, about the deep neural networks, we studied uh, recurrent neural networks, which are a type of artificial neural networks. And uh, recurrent neural networks has uh, modifications, various modifications. One of them, one of them is LSTMs. So RNNs, especially LSTMs, are one of the most effective architecture in text classification. RNNs are more powerful uh, networks uh, to model the sequential data. So that's why RNNs were popular in terms of text classification because they could uh, they are good for sequential data handling so building deeper RNNs with some adjustments i studied um, in uh, literature and uh, there was a study which combined rnn and restnet network together and the model was called recurrent residual network so this model when compared to LSTM or RNN, achieved similar accuracy or better accuracy, but with fewer parameters. Another study which combined uh, CNN and LSTM and attention mechanism. So this was a hybrid technique which uh, combined uh, CNN, LSTM and attention, and it was tested on a data set. And the recall rate and F1 value of this model is comparatively higher to same uh, is comparatively higher to uh, CNN, RNN, and LSTM algorithms alone. Their model reduces the loss of detail and improves the precision rate. Another study in which uh, CNN or RNN is used for the feature selection or vector representation of the short text, and then the vector uh, were fed into the two layered ANN, artificial neural network, for the classification purpose. And despite the model did not have hand features, uh, hand engineered features, the study had better results than the other studies in the literature. So it can be said that nowadays RNNs are commonly replaced in the traditional feed forward networks for text classification. Um, text classification, there was a study which had text classification using LSTM network and uh, its modification uh, which are by LSTM network in GRU. It was found from the study that RNNs are better existing solutions, especially the modifications LSTM and by LSTM, they provide better results. Whereas GRU, uh, the result depends on the data set and task. The choice of uh, selecting a GRU is task oriented and mostly depends on the data set. So the traditional feed power neural networks generally don't do not give good results when it comes to text classification or RNN give better results than the traditional people or neural networks. Um, there are other studies in which uh, deep learning methods were applied on the same data sets for text classification. 
and uh, it was found from the study that RNN performed better than the CNN with 5% uh, more accuracy than the CNNs. And uh, another exploration of the study, uh, those studies were that GRU uh, is also a successful method. And in the comparison paper, we found that results of RNN or LSTM are quite better. So for our study, for our paper, for our research, we used um, two different data sets. One of them is IMDB movie reviews data set. We use this data set for binary classification. Since the, this data set has only two classes, i.e. positive and negative reviews, so it is a binary sentiment classification. The data set is equally divided into training and uh, testing samples. So it has 25,000 samples for training of the model and 25,000 uh, testing uh, movie review samples for the testing of our networks. And for binary, for multi-class classification, we use Reuters News Wires data set. So Reuters data set contains overall 11,228 data samples and it has 46 labeled topics. So that means that it has 46 classes. Uh, therefore, it's, um, multi therefore, it's used for multi-class classification. So when we studied the literature, we found that the state of art results on uh, many text classification uh, tasks were often switching between CNNs and RNNs. There was some paper in which the CNNs uh, performed well when compared to other deep learning algorithms and the traditional machine learning algorithms. There is, in some of the papers, RNNs performed better than CNNs and other traditional machine learning algorithms. So, in order to find uh, either hybrid models perform better or the basic models perform better, or CNNs or RNNs perform better, we used, uh, we have proposed four different models. So we have proposed uh, some basic models such as deep CNN, deep LSTM. And we have proposed um, hybrid models which use two different networks. For example, deep CNN and LSTM, deep CNN and by LSTM. So we have proposed four different models based on if they are hybrid or if they are uh, basic. And we have added an embedding layer to each model. The purpose of adding embedding layer to each model was that embedding layer can be considered as a dictionary, which may which maps integer indices to vectors, where every integer represents uh, specifically a word from the text. So embedding layer is uh, good for learning features that are highly specific to the problem. So by using the embedding layer, we expect it to have a better generalization of our models. And then we have used 1D convolutional layer uh, for convolutional neural networks. So the purpose of using 1D convolution was that in comparison to a 2D convolution, we, could, we were enabled to use uh, larger filters by using 1D convolution. So our results were like that. We trained and tested uh, our four of the models on IMDB and uh, Reuters data set. And the comparison results are further listed in uh, table one in the next slide. So what we obtained was for IMDB data set, CNN, the combination of the hybrid model, CNN and LSTM, uh, gives an accuracy of 89.43%, which is comparatively higher than all the other uh, three models that we proposed. And for Reuters data set, we found that deep CNN model gives 71.42% accuracy, which was comparatively higher than uh, the rest of the models. So from the table, we can see that uh, CNN and LSTM has the highest accuracy and CNN and LSTM is a hybrid model, hybrid deep model. And Reuters, uh, CNN has uh, the best accuracy that is 71% and this is a basic model. So for Reuters, the reason for uh, the accuracy uh, to be less than 80% is that Reuters, uh, 
the Reuters data set has a 46 labels or 46 classes and here are training samples per class. So if we divide uh, the data set with 0 0.2 uh, test test split, then we get 195 samples per class for training. So that's why uh, for the Reuters data set, it was difficult to train our networks with such a little amount of data and, uh, and that's why the accuracy uh, dropped uh, below 80%. So another aspect of our research is that uh, the usage of GPU and CPU. Usually deep neural networks compared to the shallow neural networks require longer time to train. For this reason, we have also employed GPU to train our models. Uh, compared with CPU to see how much progress can be made in training time. So from our obtained results of the comparison between GPU and CPU, uh, we have found that GPU execution is always faster than the CPU in all our experiments on the four different models. And it was found that CNN, the, the hybrid model, CNN and LSTM model has achieved the fastest speed up of 6.14 GPU over CPU. So now to conclude our paper, um, we have presented four different deep neural network architectures in, to classify binary and multi-class sequences of text. We have trained and tested our models on two separate uh, data sets, which are IMDB and Reuters data set. The best accuracies for binary classification of IMDB data set are achieved by hybrid models. And uh, we also observed from from our experiments that uh, the models which are a combination of either LSTM or by LSTM with CNN would give better accuracies. And uh, we have achieved the highest accuracy with the CNN and LSTM model on IMDB uh, data set uh, of 89.03%. For multi-class classification of Reuters data set, um, we observed that the basic deep models performed better than the hybrid deep models. Another thing that we observed was that models, uh, for example, deep CNN, CNN and LSTM, CNN and by LSTM, those, these models all have one common thing, uh, that is each model contains a convolutional layer. So what we obtained is that um, all the models which contain the convolutional layer give better results when compared to the non-convolutional layer models, for example, deep LSTM. So the, the models that um, have uh, at least one convolutional layer for multi-class classification, they give almost 6% better accuracy over the non-convolutional models. We achieved an accuracy of 71.42% with the deep CNN model on Reuters data set. Uh, which was the highest accuracy which we could obtain on multi-class classification. So this was the conclusion, uh, the reported results and conclusion of our uh, study and what we observed during our experiments. And uh, thank you for your time and thank you for selecting our paper and uh, thank you for listening. Have a good day. Okay, uh, I would like to thank you to uh, Zaria Fatima. Fatima, I think uh, she is now in the session. Uh, Zaria, could you please uh, open your microphone and uh, if uh, it's okay, maybe uh, your camera as well so that we can see you. And uh, now I would like to ask the audience if they have any questions uh, to the speaker. You can use the chat session um, to ask your questions. Uh, I will read the question uh, uh, to um, uh, Zariap. Okay, there is one question. Um, how did you combine CNN and LSTM or CNN or uh, by, L is, uh, by LSTM? That's uh, one question. And the second one, what is the hybrid models architecture? Okay, so uh, 
Um, hello, everyone. Um, and firstly, I would like to answer uh, about the hybrid model architecture. So hybrid model is nothing but just we have combined two different types of uh, neural networks. For example, if we have combined CNN with uh, LSTM, so that makes it hybrid because it's two different types of um, um, neural networks and CNN has uh, some different specialties and LSTM is good at uh, some other things like uh, LSTMs or which are modification of RNNs, they are uh, good at extracting um, features related to context. And uh, CNN, it's uh, basically, it extracts uh, features and it's mostly uh, used, uh, mostly um, um, uh, used for, or maybe uh, preferred for uh, the use of image. So that's why we have uh, two different, uh, we have combined two different, um, uh, networks with two different specialities and that's how they uh, become hybrid uh, and the other question is how we combined uh, two different networks so uh, basically it's just uh, the whole architecture is like uh, we have provided an input layer and then uh, for extracting better features uh, of extracting the what representation of words uh, as into computing, like in vectors, we have used an embedding layer. And from the from the output of embedding layer, we provide an input to convolutional layer or any other network that we have used. And uh, from the convolutional layer, we have uh, used uh, the pooling, um, um, pooling function so that we can, whatever we have achieved uh, from the output of CNN, we can uh, downsize it and extract the best features. And then uh, we have provided it in, as an input to the LSTM and then LSTM uh, extracts more information from that. And then further it goes uh, to other layers and then it finally reaches the output where it is classified. Uh, thank you, Zaria. I also have a question for you. Uh, as the um, uh, layers uh, in the network gets increased, uh, the time mm -hmm. for becomes a problem, as you know. Uh, you mm -hmm. looked at the, uh, so um, uh, have you found uh, many, uh, I mean, uh, different uh, papers, discussions uh, on parallelizing the uh, deep learning uh, deep learning algorithms in the literature? So, what you what your observations are there? Um, when compared to the layers, there, uh, there we had uh, certain challenges. Uh, for example, uh, the data was overfitting, and then uh, to get uh, an appropriate result or an appropriate accuracy, we tried to uh, manage our manage the layers of the uh, networks and then their parameters. Uh, and yes, the time uh, was increasing. Uh, the time there was the issue of training time, uh, and to overcome that, we tried to use a uh, GPU to see if there are better uh, timing uh, improvement. Uh, but uh, during our literature, uh, we focused on uh, the um, the methods that were used that were best at giving the results of text classification. But we. Uh, haven't focused yet on the federal uh, technique that you mentioned. Uh, maybe we can uh, uh, use that uh, in future uh, as a future work for uh, increasing the accuracy or time. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, I will move forward with the next presentation. Uh, uh, so let me see. Uh, let me share the screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gudar Yalçın Alkan. I'm an assistant professor in Abdullah Gül University. Uh, in this paper, we work together with Barcelona Square Computing Center. Uh, one master, one uh, PhD student worked on that uh, project. 
and uh, the name of the paper is Effects of Hardware Fault on Artificial Networks. Uh, as a motivation of this study, first of all, uh, reliability is an important issue in hard, uh, HPCs uh, because hardware failures are significantly high in HPC systems. Uh, when we say hardware failures, we mean transient and permanent faults. And uh, they may cause a crash of the application if they are not detected or corrected, or they may cause some silent data corruptions, meaning that the application ends, the result would be incorrect and nobody can recognize it. And uh, that's why reliability is one of the major challenges in HPC systems. And uh, when you want to provide reliability now, it may increase the cost of the sig uh, system significantly. On the other side, uh, artificial neural network applications are now in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, they need high computation power and massive parallelism. That's why they are generally deployed in large data centers and HPC systems. Uh, however, they are also faced with reliability challenges since they are executed in HPC systems. Uh, so in this study, our goal is to guide how the reliability costs of uh, artificial neural network applications can be reduced. And to be able to do that, we evaluate the effects of hardware faults on ANN applications in order to reduce their reliability costs when they are executed in HPCs. Also, we analyze the overall robustness of both classical and uh, classical ANN and deep uh, neural network applications. Uh, the agenda of the work is, uh, first I talked about motivation, and now I'll explain the benchmarks and simulation environments. Later, I will show the evaluation results and conclude this talk. Uh, for the benchmark applications, uh, first of all, as a classical artificial neural network application, we choose MNIST, a, a database of handwritten digits from zero to nine, so they, it recognizes a handwritten digits. And uh, MNIST has three layers, the input layer with 784 neurons, the hidden layer with 128 neurons, and then output layer with 10 neurons. Uh, for a deep neural network application, we use ImageNet application. It's a data set of hundreds of thousands of high resolution images long into multiple categories. And finally, as a comparison, we use uh, SPEC 2006 as a conventional applications. Uh, we choose seven integer benchmark applications from that benchmark as BZIP, GCC, MCF, Hammer, SJENC with frontman H264. Uh, for the simulation environment, uh, we need to do several, uh, actually a bunch of fault injection experiments, and we use uh, two methods for that. The first one is injecting faults to architectural registers. We inject faults to architectural registers by using PIN binary instrumentation tool. And uh, for fault injection, we randomly choose an instruction during the execution of the application. And before executing that randomly selected instruction, we first execute the fault injection code in PIN. Then we continue with the instruction and the rest of the application. And uh, uh, we look at the result of the application, if it is uh, correct, meaning the fault was benign, if the application crashes before it ends, or if the result is incorrect, meaning that the fault caused the silent data corruption. Uh, we can uh, simulate both single event upsets and multiple event upsets by, with this method. And we repeat each fault injection 50 times per register for each uh, result set. The other fault injection method is uh, injecting faults to neural network layers and phases. Uh, for that, instead of executing the application uh, millions of times to see a, a, a meaningful result, we instead change the weight matrices generated in layers or phases and we fed it to the next layer or phase. And uh, we, for instance, to be able to simulate the fault during the training phase, we changed some number of bits in the weight matrices. Uh, and to be able to simulate faults in input layer, we changed the weight matrix between input layer and hidden layer. 
uh, for simulation of the faults in hidden layer, we change the weight matrix between layers um, so that we can simulate uh, faults. And uh, now I'll present our evolution results. The first one is uh, uh, different, different neural network layers and phases in MNIST application. Uh, we inject faults to the first, first of all, we inject faults to the training phase. And in the results, we see that when we increase the number of errors in the training phase, in the training matrix, actually, the accuracy drops down, obviously. And it can drop down onto 30%. Uh, but this is so if we train badly the uh, neural network, the result, the accuracy will drop. But in another sense, uh, if there was a fault in the training phase causing some silent data corruption, if, if we do not recognize it, the prediction will be really incorrect. Uh, in the second experiment, we inject the fault to the input layer between measure the vulnerability of the input layer. Uh, in if we see the, this layer is not vulnerable, if we see something closer to that, it means the uh, the, the layer is uh, highly vulnerable. So we see that. Uh, most of the time, the input layer is not vulnerable. So because we see most of you, except the bit 62. So the bit 62 is the high, uh, highly significant bit in the uh, matrix between input layer and the hidden layer. So what we can uh, say at this point is, during the input layer, uh, what we can do is we can check uh, the operations producing the bit 62 and we can make those operations uh, reliable to be able to increase the overall reliability of the ANN in check the fault to uh, the weight matrix between hidden layer and the output layer to be able to uh, evaluate the vulnerability of the hidden layer and now we see more red and uh, yellows meaning that this uh, hidden layer is uh, more vulnerable than the input layer. Next, we measure the vulnerability of uh, ImageNet for different uh, layers and phases. And now we see that uh, more uh, accuracy can be seen, but uh, also the accuracy can drop down uh, for some layers. Uh, to uh, less to around only 50 percent uh, if there is a fault in those layers specifically uh, FC uh, layers um, next we evaluate the vulnerability of uh, application when we inject both the architectural registers and in the graph uh, the x-axis shows the name of the register and the y-axis shows number of uh, runs, meaning how many runs, in how many runs we have seen uh, crashes or silent data corruptions. If the bar is blue, then it, is, it means it's not vulnerable, but if we see uh, greens and reds, it means uh, those registers are vulnerable, specifically when we execute MNIST application. And as we were expecting, we see that uh, the register RBP and RSP are the most vulnerable registers for MNIST applications. Uh, it's because, for instance, RSP keeps the stack pointer, and if there is any, uh, if stack pointer starts to show somewhere incorrect, now the uh, application uh, would crash really easily. And uh, but the point here is, we see that ANN applications are quite vulnerable to the architectural registers, and architectural registers are actually one of the places that we can see uh, faults uh, frequently in HPC systems. <clears throat> in the next step, we want to uh, simulate if 
there is an error in the data set. What happens? How it affects the uh, application? Uh, so if there is an error in the disks, uh, then it may affect the input data set, and we want to see how the prediction will be affected by that. In the uh, first graph, uh, we change, we inject the thoughts to the input labels. And uh, we, we collect them as, uh, for instance, if it is labeled zero, it means actually the, uh, the handwritten digit zeros are there. Uh, and according to the result, the, the most vulnerable uh, input data sets are labeled fours. Uh, because for if there is a slightly different input, uh, then the uh, ANM starts to predict it incorrectly. And when we look at the uh, effect of registers uh, on uh, different labels, again, some of the labels are more vulnerable. So uh, the, the accuracy of uh, ANM application also depends on what the input is. Uh, and if there is a fault, those uh, some of the values will be affected uh, higher by the, by those faults. What we can suggest in here is when the prediction output prediction is, for instance, uh, according to the first uh, graph, if the output prediction is four, now we can say that to be able to show because four is mostly affected value, we may decide to re-execute that prediction because that's the most vulnerable value. Uh, finally, uh, we compare the vulnerability of, of MNIST with uh, conventional stack applications. Uh, the first bar shows uh, the ANN application vulnerability and the rest is uh, the, stack convention, uh, the, the normal stack applications. Uh, as we can see in here, uh, the vulnerability of ANN application is actually as low as other spec applications, and in some cases, it is even lower than that. In the past, it's believed that ANN applications are uh, reliable by or fault tolerant by their nature because uh, it's just based on prediction. But uh, we can see that uh, the their vulnerability is actually as high as normal applications. As a conclusion, uh, we show that the reliability of neural network application poses serious question due to the high number of faults expected in exascale systems, meaning the future of HPC systems. And we show that the widely held belief that ANN are fault tolerant is not exactly true. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'm waiting for the questions. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Gulay, uh, who just presented the uh, um, um, paper. Uh, Hojam, if you could open your... Ah. Okay. Uh, hi. Hello, Hojam. Hi. Welcome to uh, our thank session. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. And, and now I would like to ask the audience if they have any questions. And uh, I see uh, two questions. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, the first one uh, is, is there any pre-process for input data to reduce error rate? To reduce er input data? Error rate. Uh, Go ahead. Well, hmm. but actually we just directly inject the faults to the input data set as it is. But for to provide reliability, there can be some actually uh, additional uh, pre-process. What I'm thinking is maybe some ECC can be uh, put in there uh, because in our system, there is no ECC. Well, just the disk ECC is provided, but maybe that's not enough. Um, it can be, but in this study, we didn't consider any reliability scheme. Uh, we just want to see what how much will be effect is okay mm -hmm. there's another question which says that is there a, is there any other machine learning algorithm applied to the same data rather than neural network uh rather than what rather than neural network 
No. Um, well, again, in this study, we just consider neural network applications. And actually, as you can recognize, well, I myself work on computer architecture mostly uh, for the machine learning part. We just took the algorithms as they are, actually the neural network one as they are, and we didn't change it. We just applied the algorithm and we just wanted to see how it is affected by the hardware. Uh, for this study, we didn't do that, but as a future work, we, we are considering to make it, you know, uh, including more uh, algorithms and to make comparisons between them to see the uh, which one is, for instance, we can do which algorithm is more uh, reliable than the other one, for instance. We can make this comparison, but not in this study. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, Thanks again. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I guess that's all from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks to the audience for listening as well. Impressive mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I will move forward to the next uh, uh, talk. Hi, everyone. We are Shinu Matthew. Ahmadi Topshu and Ursin Albasi from American University of the Middle East presenting a topic about prediction of COVID-19 risk in public areas using IoT and machine learning in Basrim 2020 High Performance Computing Conference. COVID-19 is a community-acquired infection and it's getting pandemic, impacting many areas including technology, education, economy and social life. And this time World Health Organization WHO recommends preventive measures such as social distancing and the use of masks and gloves to limit the transmission of the virus from person to person. Incorporating social distancing could help stop the spread of community acquired infections like COVID-19 there are significant increase in the development of different types of Internet of Things devices has been seen together with the occurrence of cyber physical systems that connect with physical environments. IoT devices, it's a form of sensors, cameras, can be wired or wireless, used everywhere. The strongest technology machine learning uses different algorithms. And here we propose a new approach for monitoring the risk of COVID-19 in public areas using IoT and machine learning technology. There is a study to assess various machine learning methods to process IoT data in smart city environment. They use different machine learning algorithms to analyze the data on traffic, weather, citizens, the environment, and the other topics in a smart city environment. Another research conducted using Base and random forest algorithms to classify 3,000 COVID-19 related posts. So they use a Chinese social media application called Sena Weibo to collect the data. Another research investigated the role of machine learning in IoT networks, and they discuss the resource management and propose or recommend some solutions for wireless IoT. And here says IoT network supports both the long range and short range communications with sufficient proof. Another interesting study conducted on chest CT data on patients to detect if the patient is infected with the COVID-19 or not. And in this uh, study, they used 3,500 images and the age average age of the patients are 34 to 64 and they found the accuracy is 87 percentage another study conducted by Ophir proposed a novel method to detect quantification and track 
COVID-19 using 2D and 3D deep learning, machine learning algorithms. So here, 157 patients data taken from USA and China. And here they found 92 percentage of this data or the result was accurate. Another study proposed an information system using artificial intelligence, which collect thousands of data from people mobile phone survey and then categorize these individuals as no risk, minimal risk, moderate risk and high risk classes. The architecture model we propose consists of three phases, data collection, data processing and output. Data collection involves IoT sensors to collect the data such as interpersonal distance, the images that to detect whether the person wear mask or not and the temperature. This data through the IoT sensors will be then given to the machine learning engine, which is part of the data processing unit. And here the received data, the extracted data will then classify using decision tree, nave base, random forest and neural network machine learning algorithms. Then using some of these data will be used to train the model. The next part to clustering this data. So for clustering, we use K means clustering algorithms and EM algorithm as well. So these algorithms will then predict safe or unsafe. Data collection consists of IoT sensors, whereas data processing deals with the organizing of these data, such as modeling, classification, and clustering. And the output consists of the details about places and the risk assessment of those areas denoted as safe or unsafe. And that is going to be the output of this model. The methodology we use here, different data such as personal, interpersonal distance, temperature, and the images through the IoT sensors will then be converted into data vectors such as V. So here it comes are different people in the same crowd. So the data sets DAB, DAC, DPC, distance from A to B, distance from A to C, distance from B to C. And MA, MB, such as whether the person A wear mask or not, MA, MA, MB, MA, MB, MC. And the temperature of each person, TA, TB, and TC, and the class denote safe or unsafe. And here we apply the machine learning algorithms, nave based classifier, neural network, decision tree, and random forest. And these algorithms will predict, classify, and cluster the crowd data vector. In order to achieve this, we use 200 crowd data sets starting from V1 to Vn through the IoT sensors. And some of these data we received used for training the model, and others used for testing, depending on the algorithms use. Here's how the experiments goes on. In these four classification algorithms, we could find 85% of the data correctly classified when we applied decision tree, whereas classified correctly while we apply so the accuracy of neural network is quite high and compared with the other three algorithms. Whereas naive and random gives the same classification accuracy, 90%. And it's also, the table also shows you how much it incorrectly classified where the uh, neural networks, 6.67% of uh, data, uh, the data incorrectly classified. Whereas decision tree, the incorrect classification is comparatively higher than the other three algorithms. So here the decision tree, which consists of flowchart applied in order to show the statistics for each classification algorithm. 
And here the Nanor represents the person distance from A to B and A to C, B to C, and also the mask information, whether the person wears mask or not, mask A, mask B, mask C. And the leaf node represents the class uh, or the category, whether it's safe or unsafe. So here in the table, the first column shows the distance from A to C, and then B represents the temperature of person B. C shows the distance uh, from person A to C, and D shows the uh, information about whether the person C wears mask or not, and E, uh, the column represents the distance from A to B, and F represents the column, uh, F represents the distance from B to C. The last one represents the class, whether it's safe or unsafe. And here the distance less than 0 0.6 in the first case, the distance was less than uh, less than 0 point, 0 0.6. It was zero, either 0 0.6 or less than 0. Point. Here, the prediction was unsafe. The case, second case, distance from person A to C was greater than 0 0.6 in meters, and uh, the temperature of person B. It's less than either 36 or maybe less than 36. And the distance from A to C was greater than 1.5 meters. So in this case, it's considered, it's predict, the system predicts safe. Whereas for an example, in case four, distance from person A to C was greater than 0 0.6 and the temperature of person B is greater than 36, 36 degrees Celsius. And the distance from person A to C is less than 1.5 meters. And person C doesn't wear mask. Okay, the value is zero, shows doesn't wear mask. There's a mask. If the system predicts it's unsafe. And the next case, the same scenario where he wears the mask but uh, the distance from A to B, it's greater than 1.1, but from A to C, it's less than 1.5, and person uh, B also has a high temperature, and the system predicts it's unsafe. And here is the statistical values and table three shows the statistical values using Kappa statistics, mean absolute error, relative absolute error, and root relative squared error. For the decision tree, nave base, and the random forest and neural net, the first column represents the decision tree, second one, nave base, and then random forest and neural network. So based on this, it shows a true positive and false positive rates for each classification algorithm uh, as shown in table four where the true positive is an outcome in which the model correctly predicts the right class whereas false positive is a result wherein the model incorrectly predicts the right class and these values are based on the statistical values. We can see that neural network and decision tree, the values are same. Whereas the false positive rate of neural network is comparatively less and naive base also not. The next part 
in the data processing uh, phase was to cluster these extracted data. So in order to clustering the data, we use expectation maximization and k-means algorithm in this k-means gives a better results compared with the others. And the k-means algorithm separates data into two clusters. 35% of the data are in cluster one, whereas 65% of the data, um, total data are in the cluster two. And this is how the distribution of data is shown in this uh, picture in two clusters. Here we conclude COVID-19 is a community acquired infection the symptoms resembling influenza and bacterial pneumonia. In this situation, we proposed a new approach to monitor crowds using IoT technologies and machine learning algorithms to detect safe and unsafe crowds or place. We use IoT sensors to collect data from indoor and outdoor areas in the feature vector, and we apply different machine learning algorithms for classification, clustering, and prediction of the result. From our analysis, neural network algorithm gives a better result compared with the other three algorithms in terms of its accuracy in classifying the data. So where neural network gives 93.33 percentage of accuracy or correctly classified the data, whereas NaveBase and the random forest gives 90 percentage of accurate data. And but the decision tree um, is just 85 uh, percentage inaccuracy. And we use 200 data vectors and all these uh, algorithms we use the same training and testing data set. Uh, perform the clustering, use expectation maximization and k-means algorithm. And where k-means algorithms did well with the two clusters, as for one for safe and the other for unsafe, gives a better results compared with the other algorithms. And that's all. And thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, we are happy to Okay, I would like to thank uh, Shino uh, for the presentation. Um, I see uh, I see Shino uh, on the screen. Uh, okay, uh, hello, welcome to our session. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I I will only uh, due to time limitation. I will only have one question for Shino. Uh, then I want to uh, move to next question. Okay. Uh, so I, um, okay, there is one question. Uh, there are many machine learning algorithms uh, uh, that are being used to predict, to classify and cluster. How did you decide the values of the parameters used, uh, used in the machine learning algorithms? Shinu, can you hear me? Um, can you, could you please repeat the question? I didn't hear well, sorry. Okay. The question is, how did you decide the parameters uh, used in the machine learning algorithms? Did you use any hyperparameter uh, optimization algorithms? How did you decide about the parameters? All right, well, hi, hello everyone. Uh, we, uh, we use the algorithms for algorithms and we really want to analyze these performance of these algorithms. And where the data are um, not much uh, constant data, it can be varies. So uh, we use the, uh, we collect the data from the, um, some of the uh, research like a DIRPA sponsored by MURI project. And some of the data we simulated, uh, we just uh, simulate the data based on COVID-19. Uh, and we also got some expert helps in this case in order to collect the data. And the purpose of the clustering was to, we need to classify the data, uh, like whether the person wears a mask or not. And then we need to uh, separate it into uh, different, uh, different number of parameters. Uh, it can be more number of parameters, uh, but we certainly focused on uh, some parameters like uh, wear mask or not. Um, if the uh, the temperature, the parameter, one of the parameter was temperature, 
and uh, the distance. And in coming forward, uh, in going forward, uh, we can add more parameters. But for this moment, we just stick with only these parameters. Can be added more parameters to show how we can use IoT and MI for uh, preventing uh, COVID-19. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, there are other questions, but due to uh, time limitation, I have to move to the next presentation. Uh, but uh, I would like you to look at the chat section of the Zoom. And if you could please answer those questions for the audience on the text, I would appreciate it. All right, good. Neural network. Yes, uh, we use the back propagation neural network. Uh, we did not apply uh, any uh, deep neural network, uh, but hopefully uh, maybe in when we have more data set, we can apply some other algorithm. But for at this pro, at this moment, we didn't use any deep learning network. We use a back propagation network, neural okay. network. Uh, so, Shino, I have to move forward. Um, so um, uh, you can you can write your answer for the uh, yeah, last sure. question on the chat section. OK. OK, thank, thank you. you. OK, uh, let me start the next presentation. Hello, everyone. Merhabalar, Deniz Nihan Gürgül diyoruz. Sizlere Ilcan Özdoğlu ve danışmanımız İsmail Han ile birlikte yaptığımız çalışmamızı ve sonuçlarını sunacağız. Yapay zeka ve otonom sistemlerin kullanımının artması ile birlikte biz de bu çalışmamızda otonom sürüş ve otonom park özelliği olan bir araç tasarımı yaptık. Diğer yapay zeka projelerinden farklı olarak projemizde uygulamaya özel donanım sistemi geliştirdik. Geçeceği tabanlı donanım hızlandırma algoritmaları geliştirerek daha hızlı kararlar verebilen prototip aracımızı başarıyla tamamladık. Yapay zeka, finans, pazarlama, sağlık, otonom araçlar gibi pek çok alanda sıklıkla kullanılmaktadır. Yapay zeka hayatımızda giderek daha fazla yer alacağı net bir şekilde görünmektedir. Özellikle yapay zeka tabanlı otonom araç geliştirmeleri oldukça ilgi çekici bir hal almaktadır. Otomobil sektöründeki neredeyse tüm firmalar yapay zeka kullanarak araçlarında otonom sürüş kabiliyetini geliştirmeye çalışıyor. Fakat günümüzde geliştirilen bu tarz teknolojiler genellikle bilgisayar üzerindeki işlem yükünü artıran çalışmalardır. İşlem gücüne olan ihtiyaç arttığı gibi enerji tüketiminde büyük bir kısıtlama olarak kalmaktadır. Bu noktada hesaplama yoğunluğu fazla olan algoritmalar için yongada sistem tasarımları birçok probleme çözüm niteliği taşımaktadır. Özellikle yapay sinir ağları kullanılarak geliştirilen algoritmaların sağladığı avantajların yanında bazı dezavantajları da bulunmaktadır. Bunlardan en önemlisi yapay sinir ağlarının işlem yükünün fazla olmasıdır. Her bir çıktı oluşma, o, e, oluşturulması sırasında floating point işlemlerinin gerçekleşmesi gerekmektedir. Yapay sinir ağı algoritması örneğin bir arm işlemcisi üzerinde çalıştırıldığı zaman bütün bu operasyonlar sıralı bir şekilde gerçekleşeceği için çıktığın oluşturulması ihtiyaç duyulandan uzun sürebilir. Aracın taşınabilir bir enerji kaynağına sahip olduğu düşünülürse, enerji tüketiminde göz önünde bulundurulması gereken bir kısıtlamadır. Yapay sinir ağlarının işlem yükü, grafik kalplerinin sağladığı paralel işlem gücü sayesinde azaltılmaya çalışılmaktadır. Fakat bu tarz yöntem hız artışı sağlasa dahi, enerji tüketimine bir çözüm oluşturamamaktadır. Uygulamaya özel donanım tasarımı, paralel işlemlerin tamamen probleme özel olarak tasarlanması sayesinde 
çok daha yüksek hızlara, çok daha düşük frekanslarda ulaşabilmektedir. Bu sayede gerekli işlem gücü elde edilirken enerji tüketimi de azaltılmış olmaktadır. Bu çalışmada önerdiğimiz metot şemada gösterildiği gibidir. İlk aşamada simülasyon ortamını oluşturduk ve makine öğrenmesinin en popüler algoritmalarından biri olan Deep Two Learning algoritmasını kullanarak eğitimlere başladık. Simülasyonda başarılı olan yapay sinir ağlarının ağırlıklarını yani kat sayılarını alarak keder dosyalarını oluşturduk. Yapay sinir ağlarına özel donanım tasarımı yapmak için bu yapay sinir ağlarının C kodlarını oluşturduk. Oluşturulan C kodlarının doğru çıktığı resim üretmediğini Python Keras ortamındaki tasarımlarla karşılaştırarak test edildi. Doğruluğundan emin olduktan sonra C, C++ gibi yüksek seviye diller ile donanım tasarımı imkanı sağlayan Vivado HLS programını kullanarak donanım tasarımlarını oluşturdu. Oluşturulan tasarımları tekrar test edip doğruladık. Prototip üzerinde deneylere başlamak için gerekli mesafe sensörü, motor kontrolü ve kamera tasarımlarının VHDL ile kodlayarak oluşturduk. Bütün tasarımların bir arada senkronize bir şekilde çalışmasını sağlayacak olan çip üzeri sistem mimarisini oluşturduk. Son olarak prototip üzerinde deneyleri yapar sonuca ulaştık. Deep Q Learning metodu, bir ajanın bir ortamda uyguladığı eylemlerden aldığı ödülleri analiz etmesi ve sonraki kararlarda kazanacağı ödülü arttırmaya yönelik eylemleri seçip problemi çözmeye dayalı bir yöntemdir. Bu çalışmada aracın verdiği kararlara göre aldığı ödülleri bir ödül mekanizması oluşturarak belirledik. Farklı ödül mekanizmaları deneyerek en iyi sonuca ulaşmaya çalıştık. Fakat Deep Q Learning metodu ile ajanın problemi çözmesi uzun sürebilir. Ajanın ortamda birçok deneme yaparak çevreyi keşfetmesi gerekir. Bu yüzden eğitimler simülasyon ortamında yapılmalıdır. Biz de gerçek ortamla birebir uyuşması için simülasyon ortamını kendimiz oluşturduk. Böylece aracın dönüş açısı, büyüklüğü, ortamın şekli gibi değişken olabilecek faktörler kolayca düzenlenebilir oldu. Sağ tarafta geliştirdiğimiz simülasyon ortamı ve gerçek ortam görülmektedir. İki farklı yapay sinir ağı modelini Deep Q Learning metodu ile eğittik. Bunlardan bir tanesi park alanı bulunana kadar aracın otoparkta güvenli bir şekilde ilerlemesini sağlarken arka planda çalışan görüntü işleme algoritması park alanını tespit edince diğer model devreye girerek park işleminin tamamlanmasını sağlar. Burada aracın otoparkta güvenli bir şekilde ilerlemesini sağlayan modelin eğitim sürecinden bir kesit görülmektedir. Yapay sinir ağları eğitimleri sırasında araçta bulunan 3 mesafe sensörünün değerlerini kullandıkları için input layer sayıları iki yapay sinir ağı modeli için de 3'tür. Output layer sayısı aracın çıktı olarak ürettiği eylemlerin sayısıdır. Otoparkta ilerlemeyi sağlayan yapay sinir ağı modelinde araç sağ sol ve ileri hareketlerini yapmaktadır. Bu sebeple output layer sayısı 3'tür. Park işlemini gerçekleştiren yapay sinir ağı modelinde ise araç sağ, sol, ileri ve durma hareketlerini yapmaktadır. Bu nedenle output layer sayısı 4'tür. Görevini simülasyon ortamında başarıyla tamamlayan yapay sinir ağlarını kaydettik ve test aşamasına geçtik. Eğitimi tamamlanan modellerin doğruluğunu yapay sinir ağının ürettiği çıktıları gözlemleyerek onayladık. Ekranda bu test aşaması görülmektedir. Araç, yapay sinir ağının çıktılarına göre 3 farklı eylem gerçekleştirmektedir. Yapay sinir ağı 3 farklı eylem için ayrı ayrı kalite değeri üretir. Konsoldaki çıktılardan en soldaki ileri harekete, ortadaki sola dönme hareketini, en sağdaki sağa dönme hareketini temsil eder. Araç en yüksek değere sahip olan eğilimi seçerek hareket eder. Aracın seçimlerindeki kesinliği ve doğruluğu kontrol ettikten sonra donanım hızlandırıcısı tasarlamak için yapay sinir ağının C kodunu oluştu. VHDL, veri log gibi düşük seviye donanım tanımlama dilleri ile yapay sinir ağları gibi karmaşık algoritmaları programlamak zaman ve üzerine çalışan insan sayısı açısından oldukça maliyetlidir. Vivado HLS, 
C, C++ gibi yüksek seviye dillerden RTL yani Register Transfer e, Level seviyesinde kod üretir. Oluşturduğumuz C kodları ile yüksek seviye sentezleyici kullanarak donanım tasarımları elde ettik. Fakat tasarımda önemli olan nokta donanımın ihtiyaç duyulan işlem gücünü sağlayabilmesidir. Bu yüzden Vivada içerisinde tasarımın nasıl olması gerektiği hakkında düzenleme yapmamızı sağlayan pragma direktiflerini kullanarak işlem gücü ve enerji tüketim açısından verimli donanımlar elde ettik. Ekranda yapay sinir ağı modeli için oluşturulmuş C kodunun bir bölümü görülmektedir. Bu kod bölümünde pipeline direktifini kullandık ve başlangıç aralığı olarak iki değerini seçtik. Böylece her bir iç döngü başladıktan iki çevrim sonra bir sonraki dış döngünün işlemlerinin başlamasını sağladık. Bu değer bir seç olarak da seçilebilirdi. Hatta daha iyi sonuçlar da elde edilebilirdi. Fakat kaynak kullanımı artış gösterecek. Sağladığı iyileştirme ve kaynak kullanımındaki artış göz önünde bulundurularak iki değerini seçtik. Elde edilen hızlandırmayı gözlemlemek için oluşturulan C kodlarını önce Zinc ARM işlemcisi üzerinde çalıştırdık. Daha sonra aynı çıktığı oluşturabilen donanım hızlandırıcıların çalışma sürecini ölçtük. Tabloda görüldüğü gibi 17 katlık bir hız artışı elde ettik. Bunun yanı sıra ARM işlemci 667 MHz'de kalsa çalışırken donanım hızlandırıcılarını 100 MHz'de çalıştırdık. Bu da elde edilebilecek enerji tasarrufunu göstermektedir. Tasarımda yazılım ve donanım ortak e, tasarım metodolojisini izledik. ARM işlemci kullanılarak işlemci dostu süreçler işlemci üzerinde gerçekleştirilirken donanım ile kullanılması daha avantajlı olan süreçler için donanım tasarımı oluşturduk. Ve bu tasarımların kontrolü ve senkronizasyonunu yine ARM işlemciyle sağladık. Processing System ve Programmable Logic ikisi birlikte Yongo üzeri sistem tasarımını yapmamızı sağlıyor. EXR haberleşme protokolüyle konuşabilen IP çekirdekleri ürettiğimiz için işlemci ile donanım blokları arası haberleşme sağlanabiliyor. Burada tasarımda kullanılan malzemeler görülmektedir. Çip üzeri sistem mimarisi için Z-Board geliştirme kartı ve motor kontrolü için Arduino kullanılır. Mesafe sensörleri için de HCSR-04 sensörlerini kullanılır. Çizdiğimiz blok dizaynda görüldüğü üzere buradaki iki kısım Processing System, kalan diğer donanım tasarımları ise Programmable Logic partını temsil ediyor. Tabloda oluşturulan donanım tasarımının kaynak kullanımı görülmektedir. Tam bağlantılı model bir kullanılarak gerekli iyileştirilmenin oluşturulması durumunda modelin ne kadar kaynak kullanacağına dair gözlemler. Bu model projenin son halinde kullanılmayan deneysel bir modeldir. Tabloda görüldüğü gibi bu modelin blok RAM kullanımı %50'nin üzerindedir. Bu model bize asıl kullanacağımız modellerin büyüklüğü ile ilgili fikir verdi. Projede iki tane yapay sinir ağı modeli kullanılacağı için daha küçük modeller kullanılmasına karar verdik. Eğitimleri daha küçük modeller üzerinde gerçekleştirdik. Tasarımın tamamı düşünüldüğünde bu kat table cinsinden baktığımızda bu oran %63 olarak görülüyor. Slice cinsinden baktığımızda ise bu oran %90'lara ulaşıyor. Kartı kapasitesini olabildiğince kullanarak istenilen verim ve işlem gücüne ulaşmaya çalıştık. Bu videoda projemizin demosunu görüyorsunuz. Çarpmadan ilerlemeyi sağlayan yapay sinir ağı modeli aktifleştirildi ve araç otoparkta ilerlemeye başladı. Görüntü işleme algoritması park alanını tespit etti ve park işlemini gerçekleştirecek yapay sinir ağı modeli aktifleştirildi. Park işlemi başarıyla tamamlandı. Araç tekrar park işlemi için harekete geçti. Fakat ilk park alanı müsait olmadığı için araç park alanında ilerlemeye devam etti. İkinci park alanı tespit edildi ve park modeli devreye girerek park işlemini tamamladı. Bizi dinlediğiniz için teşekkür ederiz. Evet, e, ismi andı aramızda galiba. Evet, merhabalar. Teşekkür ederiz sunumun için. 
e, zaman sınırımızdan dolayı sana olan e, sunum e, soruları e, offline chat üzerinden yapalım. E, bir sonraki soruya geçelim ama ben e, katılımcıların İsmihan'a sorularını lütfen chat üzerinden sormalarını isteyeceğim. İsmihan senden de soruları chat ortamında e, yanıtlamanı isteyeceğim. Zamanımız e, sınırlı. Ben e, müsaadenizle bir sonraki sunuma geçmek istiyorum. Tamamdır. Teşekkür ederim. Merhabalar, adım Hakan Aktaş, Aktaş Üniversitesi Elektrik Elektrik Mühendisliği Doktor Öğrencisiyim. Bu çalışmayı Danışman Hocam, Doçent Doktor Önüç Bonat ile beraber gerçekleştirdik. Çalışmamızın adı Derin Öğrenme ile Tohumların Sınıflandırılmasında Renk ve Kenar Bilgisi Neticesi. Çalışmanın amacı ve özgün değeri, bu çalışmada buğday, pirinç, kırmızı mercimek ve yeşil mercimek tohumlarının derin öğrenme ile sınıflandırılması hedeflenmektedir. Literatördeki çalışmalardan farklı olarak e, ikili görüntü ve kenar bilgisi görüntü ve setleri de kullanılmıştır. Literatördeki, literatördeki çalışmalarda daha çok RGB ve grayscale e, görüntü formatları kullanılmaktadır. Yine literatördeki çalışmalardan farklı olarak kendi veri setimizi kendi deney düzenlemek üzerinde oluşturduk. E, yine e, literatördeki çalışmalarda tohum görüntüleri bir e, zemin üzerinde yayılarak bu sabit görüntüye çekilmekte. Ancak biz tohumlar serbest düşme yaparken görüntülerini çektik ve e, serbest düşme yaparken tohumlar sürekli döndüğü için tüm kombinasyonlardaki görüntüler elde edilmiş oldu. E, yine bu çalışma sonucunda elde edilerek edilecek çıktılara göre gelecek çalışmalar için farklı veri yapıların önerilmesi hedeflenmektedir. Tohum sınıflandırma üzerine literatürde yapılan bazı çalışmalar şu şekildedir. 2015 yılında e, Hüseyin ve Ajaz makine öğrenmesi algoritmalarını kullanarak %95.2 dolarlıkta e, bir çalışma yapmıştır. Yine 2017 yılında Aslan ve Değerle bir e, buğday tohumlarını sınıflandırması üzerine iki yöntem denemişlerdir. E, yapay sinir ağları ile yapılan e, sınıflandırma sonucu %87.93 olarak bulunmuştur. Aşırı öğrenme makinesi yöntemiyle yapılan sınıflandırma sonucu da %94.44 olarak bulunmuştur. Biz bu çalışmada e, tohumları sınıflandırması için Alex yapısını kullandık ve derin öğrenme ile yapılan sınıflandırma sonucu e, en, en yüksek doğru oranı %100 olarak hesaplanmıştır. Veri setini oluşturmak için e, şekildeki bir, bir deney düzeni kullandık. Bu deney düzeninde e, 63 FPS global çat özelliğine sahip RGB bir basfer kamera bulunmaktadır. Yine vibrasyon motoru hazme ve oluk bulunmaktadır. Yine e, deney düzeninin içerisinde bir ön aydınlık sistemi bulunmaktadır. Vibrasyon motoru titreşim e, sayesinde oluk üzerindeki tohumlar serbest düşme yapmakta. Serbest düşme yaparken de RGB kamera bu tohumların görüntülerini çekmektedir. Bu sayede veri setleri oluşturmaktadır. Burada tohumlar düşerken çekilmiş örnek görüntüler görülmektedir. Buğday, pirinç, yeşil mercimek ve kırmızı mercimek tohumları. Derin öğrenmede sınıflandırma sonucunun iyi olabilmesi için veri setinin çok büyük olması gerekmekte. Bu yüzden her bir tohuma ait yeterli sayıda görüntü elde etmeye çalıştık. Örneğin buğday için 353 tane yani bu ve bunun gibi 353 tane <gülüyor> görüntü kaybettik. E, Tabi e, sınıflandırma işlemi Alexnet yapısıyla yapılacak olup Alexnet e, yapısında giriş görüntü e, giriş görüntüsü 227 çarpı 227 bir görüntü böyle bir veri seti oluşturabilmek için e, buradaki görüntülerden yani ana görüntülerden e, toplu olayların kesilmesi ve uygun yani 227 çarpı 227 uygun hale getirmesi gerekmektedir. 
bu işlemleri yapabilmek için e, block detection yöntemi kullanılmıştır. Bu yöntem sayesinde e, topluma, yani toplumlara ait merkez noktası, x1, x2 noktası, y1, y2 noktası ve alan bilgisi elde edilmektedir. Bu bilgiler kullanılarak çok rahat bir şekilde e, görüntüdeki topun e, istenilen formatta kesilebilmektedir. Bu metot kullanılarak elde edilen toplam blok sayıları minimum 2.900 adet buğday tohumu ve maksimum 5157 adet yeşil mercimek tohumu elde edilmiştir. Biz bu çalışmada literatürdeki çalışmalardan farklı olarak ikili görüntü ve kenar bilgisi görüntü veri setleri de oluşturduk. Burada örnek bir görüntü görüyorsunuz. İlk sütun ve buğday tohumuna ve ilk buğday tohumunun acil bir görüntüsü. Bunlar elde edilmiş gri formatı görüntüsü. Bunlar elde edilmiş ikili görüntüsü ve yine gri formatı görüntüsü elde edilmiş kenar bilgisi görüntüsü görmektesiniz. Bu sayede dört farklı tohum ve dört farklı veri yapısı kullanılarak toplamın 16 adet veri seti oluşturmuştur. Bu 16 adet veri seti oluşturduktan sonra e, elde edilen veri setleri aritmik yapısıyla eğitilmiş ve sınıflandırılmıştır. Tablo 1'e bakacak olursak, tablo 1'de RGB ve gri formattaki veriler kullanılarak sınıflandırma sonuçları görülmektedir. Tablo 1'deki veri setleri oluşturulurken %70, %15, %15 RGB veri setinin doğruluk oranı %100 olarak hesaplanmıştır. Gri formattaki veri setinin doğruluk oranı en yüksek %99.54 olarak hesaplanmıştır. Yine veri setindeki veri sayıları azaldığında ve tur sayıları azaldığında özellikle gri formattaki görüntü sonuçlarına bakarsak test doğruluğu sürekli azaldığını görmekteyiz. Yine bu çalışmada veri setindeki oranlarının değiştirildiğinde doğruluk kontekst test doğruluğunu nasıl değiştirildiğini görebilmek için tablo 2'de farklı oranlarda bir veri seti oluşturduk. Tablo 2'deki veri seti %50 eğitim, %25 doğrulama ve %25 test olmak üzere oluşturulmuş bir veri setidir. Bu sonuçlara baktığımızda tablo 2'deki test doğruluk sonuçlarının tablo 1'e göre daha düşük olduğu görülmektedir. Yani buradan e, buradan yola çıkarak bu uygulamada %70, %15, %15 oranlarının kullanılmasının daha efektif olacağını söyleyebiliriz. Yine e, bir sonraki aşamada e, RGB ve gri görüntü değil de ikili görüntü ve kenar bilgisi görüntüleri kullanılarak Bunların RX yapısıyla eğitilmesi ve test edilmesi işlemi yapılmıştır. Bu, bunların sonuçlarını buradaki tabloda görebiliriz. İkili görüntü için en yüksek test doğruluğu %78.20 olarak hesaplanmıştır. Kenar bilgisi için de en yüksek test doğruluğu %92.99 olarak hesaplanmıştır. Açıkçası bu o doğruluk oranı yüksek bir doğruluk oranı. Çünkü kenar bilgisi setine baktığımızda nesneye ait çok az bilgi içermekte. Ama doğruluk olanı oldukça yüksek. Yine bu sonuçları karışıklık matrisi üzerinden yorumlayacak olursak aslında buradaki tohumları biz bilinçli olarak seçtik. Çünkü buğday tohumu e, renk bilgisini yok sayarsanız buğday tohumu pirince benzemekte. Kırmızı mercimek, yeşil mercimeğe benzemekte aslında. E, buğday tohumu e, için yorumlar, yorumlarsak Hedef sınıf buğday tohumu olması gerekirken pirinç olarak hesaplanan tohum sayısı 70. Yine hedef sınıf pirinç olması gerekirken buğday olarak hesaplanan tohum sayısı 26'dır. Yani bu iki tohum birbirine benzen, benzediği için yanlış hesaplanan tohum sayıları fazla çıkmaktadır. Bu çalışmadaki bu çalışmanın bir diğer çıktısı ise Gelecekte e, tohum sınıflandırma ve ayıklama makinelerinin derin öğrenmeyle yapılabilmesi için e, bir ön çalışma olmuştur aslında. Şöyle ki, sağ tarafta tohum sınıflandırma makinesini görmektesiniz. Tohum sınıflandırma makinesi çalışma prensibinde tohumlar içindeki istenmeyen nesneler e, uygun algoritmalarıyla test edilmekte ve sonrasında e, 
okey not okey olarak bayıklanmak nedir? Böyle bir sistem gerçek zaman olarak çalıştırmak istenirse minimum gereksinimde şöyle bir yapıya ihtiyaç vardır. Yani kameradan gelen görüntü okunacak. Bu görüntüye blok algoritması uygulanacak. Blok algoritması sonucu görüntüdeki tohumlar çıkarılacak. Bu tohumlar daha sonra sınıflandırılacak ağ yapısına göre uygun hale getirilecek ve yukuda sınıflandırılacak. Sınıflandırma sonlarına göre de okey ya da not okey olarak ayırtılacak. Örneğin kullanılan kamera 50 f ise böyle bir sistem gerçek zamanlı olabilmesi için her bir frenin işlenmesi için 20 saniyelik süre ihtiyacımız vardır. E, bu 20 saniye aslında e, ön işlemin e, sınıflandırmanın ve e, karar aşamasının toplam süresidir. E, yaptığımız geçmiş çalışmalardan ve literatür e, araştırmasından biliyoruz ki bu ön işlemler FPGA üzerinde çok yüksek hızlarda gerçekleştirilmektedir. Yani 20 saniye civarında aslında burayı FPGA kartıyla çok rahat gerçekleştirebilirsiniz. Yine karar mekanizması 20 saniye mertebesinde çok rahat gerçekleştirilmektedir. Yani şöyle ki, eğer ki FPJ artı GQ artı CQ'lu bir sistem kullanıldığında ön işlem FPJ'leri 20 saniyede karar mekanizması 20 saniyede yapılabilmekte ve kullanılan kamera 50 FPS ise noktalandırma için benim 18 saniye süren kalmaktadır. Bu bir görüntüde bulunan toplam blok sayısına göre iyi bir süre de olabilir. Blok sayısı çok fazla ise kötü bir süre de olabilir. Bizim yaptığımız bu çalışma ile gelecekte sınıflandırma için sınıflandırma işlemi daha hızlı yapılabilmesi için farklı veri yapılarının önerilmesi üzerine geliştirmeyi tercih ediyoruz. Bu çalışmadan elde edilen sonuçlar şu şekilde. Tohum sınıflandırmasına kenar bilgisinin ne kadar önemli olduğu gösterilmiştir. Tohum sınıflandırma ve tohum ayıklama makinelerinde sistemin gerçek zamanlı olabilmesi için farklı türlerde dataları kullanılabileceği gösterilmiştir. Yani RGB datanın tümünü kullanmak yerine kenar pikselinin kullanılması bu sayede konvansiyon işlemlerinin daha hızlı yapılabilmesi hedeflenmektedir. Sistemin gerçek zamanlı olabilmesi için FPJ ve GPO'nun birlikte kullanılması tümün bir çözüm olabilir. Kullanacak FPJ kartı ile blok analizi ve hibrit datanın hazır hale getirilmesi yapılacaktır. Verin öğrenme ile sınıflandırma işleminde hibrit data kullanılacak olup bu sayede GQ üzerindeki sınıflandırma işlemlerinin yüksek hızlarda yapılması hedeflenmektedir. Bu veri setler üzerinde küçük bir test yaptık. RGB ve kenar bilgisi veri setlerini AlexNet ile test sürelerini karşılaştırdığımızda Meta platformu kullanarak kenar bilgisi veri setinin RGB veri setine göre 10 kat daha hızlı bir şekilde sınıflandırıldığı görülmektedir. Yani gelecekte hibrit veri yapıları kullanarak sınıflandırma işlerinin daha sınıflandırma işlemlerinin daha yüksek hızlarda yapılması bu sayede gerçek zamanlı sistemlere daha uygun hale getirilmesi hedeflenmektedir. Bu çalışma Akdeniz Üniversitesi ve TÜBİTAK Bilek tarafından desteklenmiştir. Her iki kuruma da teşekkür ederiz. Dinlediğiniz için teşekkür ederim. Sorularınız varsa alabilirim. Evet, e, Hakan'a teşekkür ederiz. Hakan e, de aramızda e, görüntüne bir de mikrofonunu açarsan. E, e, bugünkü oturumumuzu 5 e, dakika gecikmeyle tamamlamış olduk. Ben e, Hakan'ın e, oturumda kalmasını rica ediyorum. E, sorularını... Herkese merhabalar. Merhaba Hakan, teşekkür ederiz sunumun için. Yani Katılımın için. E, ben e, izleyicilerden e, sorularını chat ortamında sana sormalarını rica ediyorum. E, zaten sunum sırasında da fark ettim. Sana sorular var. Evet. E, o ortamda yanıtlarsan çok memnun olurum. Çünkü bir sonraki e, sesyonun süresine girdik. E, Can Hocam, Can Öztürhan Hocam da olmalı. E, e, bakın, e, sizden ricam ee, bir sonraki e, session için Can Öztürk'ün hocamızı koos yaptınız. Evet. Ee, hocam lütfen buyurun. Biraz gecikmeyle size veriyoruz session'ı. Ee, lütfen devralım.
thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's been a good conference uh, and uh, I have been watching the talks. Uh, they are uh, pretty good. Uh, so we are going to start uh, our uh, uh, next uh, session, uh, which will be about high performance computing and algorithms. Uh, we have four presentations here, so it will be faster, I guess. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether my uh, uh, video is reaching there. Is it all right? Uh, uh, okay. okay, now I think it's okay. Uh, so uh, what we are going to do is start with the first talk, uh, uh, which is titled uh, spanning tree-based uh, clustering algorithm using inconsistent uh, distance methodology. Uh, the presenter will be Fadi Shar uh, from Ankara Yildirim Beyazıt University. Uh, it's authored also by uh, uh, let me see, Ahmed uh, Topcu uh, from uh, uh, American University of Middle East. So let me start the presentation. Uh, you can uh, ask your questions in the chat box. Uh, My name is Fadi Shahar, PhD student at Yildirim Beyazıt University. Just a second. Yes, uh, I'll do that and then start it. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Everybody, my name is Fadi Shahar, PhD student at Yildirim Beyazıt University. I'm working with Dr. Ahmed Erjan Topju in the field of data clustering. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my work at Bachelor Conference. In this presentation, I'm going to demonstrate my paper, my submitted paper. The title of my paper is a new Doctor, we cannot hear the presentation. Jan Hocam, you have to unmute because uh, so your microphone has to be open in order for us to hear. Okay. Moving a set of objects into classes of okay set of objects in an unsupervised manner. Yes, so the yes. applications of data clustering are so many. We have emi segmentation, text categorization, like the one which is used in search engine. We have, can use it for biomedical field for gene analysis, security field for intrusion detection. We can use it, use it also in the marketing for market segmentation. However, the issues related to data crossing are also so many. Just to list a few, so we have different ways of measuring similarity between objects, whether to use Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, density. In the database space, we have Inkowski and we have proximity measure. So also the, measuring the validity of cluster, how we can tell that the generated cluster or the obtained cluster are good or not. So a wide variety of data clustering algorithms have been proposed in the literature. However, no universal solution for all problems. Each kind of data clustering algorithm tries to solve part of the problem. So in the, the literature, we have like three main kinds of data clustering algorithms. We have partitional based, density based, and hierarchical based data clustering algorithms. As a result, for me as a user, it is very difficult to uh, to uh, to choose a suitable algorithm uh, which is best suited for my data sets because I don't have a prior knowledge about the distribution nature of my data sets. So this is a dilemma of clustering. Mentioned some related works. Uh, we started with the partitional based data clustering algorithms, so which is a division of data objects into subsets, into clusters, such that each data object is exactly in one cluster. So the well-known algorithm in, data, in partitional based, which is the k-means, k-means, which is based on the centroid idea. It is a symbol. It is simple to implement and easy to understand. However, 
this algorithm has like major disadvantages. You have to specify the number of clusters in advance. It doesn't work when the clusters are different in terms of size, densities, and where the, the, the clusters are non-spherical shapes. So it has a problem where the data contains also outliers. The obtained clusters also are vary from one run to another. As we can see in the figure on the right side here, the angle they failed to find the proper clusters because the shape of the clusters are non-spherical shapes. Similarly, we have also in the density-based data clustering algorithm uh, where the cluster is a, a dense region of points, so which is separated by low density regions from other regions of high density. So we have a DB scan, which is the when one algorithm in density based. So here we have three kinds of data points. We have the core point, we have border, and we have the noise point. So this kind of algorithm, it is like it doesn't have like you don't have to specify the number of clusters in advance. However, you need to specify other hyperparameters. So this algorithm it is resistant to noise and it can handle clusters of different shapes and sizes. However, it is required to specify two parameters, epsilon and the minimum points, and also it doesn't work well with high dimensionality data. So the last group of data clustering algorithm that we need to talk in the related works, uh, which is the MST-based data clustering algorithm. So MST first, let us define what is MST, which is Doctor, we cannot hear the presentation. The voice is muted, I think. Consider as the grid distance. So the weight of each edge in the image. Same algorithm, I mean, in order to get some clusters, we need to specify the inconsistent edges which is the longest edges. So by cutting the longest edges gradually, we will end up having a cluster that contains only one data point, and which is not an ideal result. So this is the major disadvantages, disadvantage of this kind of data clustering algorithm. So the, the research objective and contribution, the contribution of this work actually, we propose a new data clustering algorithm based on MST and based on inconsistent distance methodology to solve the main issue of MST-based clustering algorithm, which is identifying the inconsistent edges. So the proposed algorithm can determine the number of clusters of a given data set, regardless of the distribution nature of the data. Flexible, easy to understand, and simple, and doesn't need to specify any hyperparameter in advance. The algorithm is capable of detecting clusters of irregular boundaries with different size and shape and different density. The order of data points has no impact on the final result. The algorithm overcomes most of the problems or the issues related to the previous algorithms that we have talked about. So the proposed algorithm, actually, it is based on the concept, the basic concept of data clustering, which is saying that we need to make sure that the distance between any two points in different clusters is larger than the distance between any two points within a cluster. So based on this definition and based on the concept of inconsistent distance, which is the maximum distance within clusters in the data set, we can start defining our proposed algorithm. So to understand it, we, I just choose a sample uh, data set, uh, which is, I mean, consists of three simple clusters, three well-separated clusters, to just to understand the concept of this proposed algorithm. So the first step is to find the fully connected graph, which is the distance between 
each data point with respect to all other data points in the data set. So after we found the fully connected graph, we need to identify the nearest neighbors for each data point. So using the fully connected graph, we identify the nearest neighbors for each data point. From these nearest neighbors, we need to identify the inconsistent distance. Now the inconsistent distance, it is the maximum distance within the nearest neighbors. So what is the, the maximum of the nearest neighbors? It is the, the inconsistent distance, we call it lambda here, which is 1.68. Using the inconsistent distance, which is 1.68, we need to cut now to get some, in order to get some clusters, to get the proper clusters, we need to cut the MST graph or to identify the inconsistent edges that we need to cut in order to get a good clusters. So any edge or any edge or any distance in the MST graph which is greater than the inconsistent edge or the inconsistent distance which is 1.68 it will be marked as inconsistent edge to be cut later in order to get some clusters. So by cutting the inconsistent edges using the inconsistent distance, which is lambda. Now we can see that this is the obtained cluster, the proper obtained clusters. We have here three different clusters. So as we can see, the algorithm it is simple, easy to understand. And here we can see the pseudo code of the proposed algorithm. We need to load the data. We need to, uh, to, to, to calculate the, the distance, the fully connected graph, which is the distance for each data point with respect to all other data points. Then we need to identify the minimum distance. And then from this minimum, find the minimum distance, which is the maximum, uh, the, the, the, the nearest neighbors. Uh, after we found the nearest neighbors, we need to identify the inconsistent distance, which is the maximum of nearest neighbors. Then from this one, we need to calculate the MST graph. From the MST graph, we need to calculate the, we need to, to identify the inconsistent edges. Each distance, which is greater than the inconsistent distance, it will be marked as zero to be cut later. So we marked all the inconsistent edges as zero. Then the connected components of the MST graph after we cut the inconsistent edges, it will form the obtained clusters. So uh, the, the experimental analysis and comparison, the, the proposed algorithm has been tested and evaluated using four synthetic data sets, DS1 to DS4, and four real world data sets, DSR1, DSR4, until DSR4. And the proposed algorithm also it is compared with the following five well-known clustering algorithm. We have k-mini from partitional base, single linkage from hierarchical base, spectral clustering from graph base, and dbscan from density base. We have also compared with the peers, which is also the from hierarchical based data clustering algorithm. So these two tables actually describe the both the synthetic and the real. Uh, data sets. Uh, this is the attributes of the data set that we have used uh, in the experimental result to get the experimental result. So we have the number of instances, we have the number of attributes and number of classes. Here we have the experimental result on the synthetic data sets. We have DS1 and DS2. We try to uh, use like uh, different shades and the, the different densities of synthetic data sets to uh, evaluate and validate the, the obtained clusters uh, and compare it with, with the five different data clustering algorithms. We can see here in this figure actually that the proposed algorithm here it, it is like outperform the other clustering algorithm. We can see that the proposed algorithm can find the, the clusters properly while the others are uh, failed to find it 
like a spectral clustering and PH and k means. As we said that because k means it is based on the centroid, uh, it is failed to find the, the, the proper clustering because it is non spherical shape of data clustering of, of clusters. Similarly, here we have in the, on the uh, experiment in, on, on DS3 and DS4, we can see here also we have uh, the, the proposed algorithm also find the, the proper clusters uh, and it is comparable with the others, but the others are failed. For example, as you can see here, only the single linkage uh, can find the, the proper clusters with uh, the MST, the proposed algorithm. Also to, to like, we have done some cluster quality analysis to evaluate the goodness of cluster clustering result. So we exploit the cluster accuracy. We use the, the, the cluster accuracy as a metric, as an external clustering validation metric to evaluate the goodness of the clustering results. And the accuracy, I mean, the cluster accuracy is the percentage of total number of truly classified So we cannot hear the, the voice. Uh, so, uh, can you unmute? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Table four that the proposed algorithm is it okay like now? either similar or it is better than the yeah, thank you. obtained by other clustering. We can see it uh, in the bold. Uh, we can see it on the table three and table four. So as a conclusion, the, the, the, the definition of the inconsistent edge is the major issue in the, in the data clustering, in the MST-based data clustering algorithms. And in order to solve this problem, we have proposed an MST-based clustering method. We try to identify the inconsistent edge in the MST-based clustering by using the inconsistent distance methodology. We exploit the Euclidean distance between the two vertices in the MST as a distance measure. And the proposed algorithm is also free from any user defined parameters. And it can estimate the number of clusters accurately. The experimental results on synthetic and real world data sets illustrate that the proposed clustering algorithm as an overall better performance comparing with the most common algorithms, single linkage, DB scan, K means, PH, and spectral clustering. Thank you for listening. We thank the speaker for the nice presentation. We have some uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, if you would like to answer them, uh, uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, answer the questions in the chat box. Sure, sure, Doctor. Thank you so much. I have shared the screen, so please go ahead. Okay, Doctor. Uh, the first question uh, from Ersi. Uh, so can I answer it like uh, I have to write it on the chat, doctor, or can I answer it directly now? No, no, no. Just directly by speaking. Just okay. So it's a question say that, can we say that the proposed clustering algorithm gives similar results for any type of data? Actually, the proposed algorithm, it can only works for numerical data sets. It cannot not work for like for categorical uh, kinds of data sets. It, it can just work for numerical based data sets. Uh, 
the second question from Tolga. I have a question, Ferdi, thank you. Can we find the optimum number of clusters with your clustering approach? This seems double to me. Uh, actually, yes, we can find the, the optimal number of clusters. Uh, the algorithm uh, doesn't need to specify any higher parameter in advance. You don't need to say, for example, we need two or three clusters. You don't have to specify. Uh, the algorithm can identify the number of clusters. If there existed overlaps uh, in the clustering, uh, actually, the proposed algorithm, what I have presented here, is not like the full, fully picture about the algorithm. Uh, I mean, the algorithm, it has other functions. It can also detect the outliers. Uh, and also, we have some factors to like to study, the, to do some cluster analysis for each cluster, uh, whether we need, for example, to merge two clusters together and uh, the relationship between clusters. So these factors I didn't discuss here in this presentation. Uh, because we have restriction, I mean, uh, the, the maximum number of pages uh, for the paper, it is six. So that's why I didn't include all the, the, the functions of this algorithm. I think that's all. Uh, doctor, if you have a question also, I'm, I'm ready to answer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I do not have... Uh any question it was a very good presentation uh, very informative and very nice work uh, thank you doctor uh, we are going to move to the next uh, talk uh, which will be given by uh, Jen Tüsüs uh, from uh, Middle East Technical uh, University uh, the title is uh, performance of particle tracking using a quantum graph neural network uh, let me just uh, show the video. Sunumla ilk başta parça kez oluşturma problemi ne olduğunu tanımlayarak ve ardından da kemal yarışmasından bahsederek başlayacağım. Ardından daha önceden başka araştırma yasak tarafından yapmıştık. Başka bir şey var mı? Başka bir şey kendi projemize bir geçiş yapacağım ve e, sizlere kendi oluşturduğumuz kuantum çizgi sınavı yönteminden bahsedeceğim. Son olarak da elde ettiğimiz e, sonuçlar, bulgular ve bu sonuçları ileride nasıl daha iyi bir hale getirebiliriz? Bunlarla ilgili görüşlerimi sunacağım. Parçacık izi oluşturma problemini anlamadan önce e, parçacık hız, hızlandırıcılarında bu olaylar nasıl gerçekleştiriyor? Onu biraz daha iyi anlamamız gerekiyor. Eğer sol tarafa bakacak olursak iki tane parçacık, parçacık demetin e, bir araya gelip ortada e, çarpıştığını ve ardından etrafa yeni parçacıklar saçtığını görüyoruz. Ve her birisinin farklı açılarla e, hareket ettiğini görüyoruz. Bunun e, iki tane sebebi var. E, e, bu düşünme sebep olan olay e, genelde bu parçacık detektörlerinin e, içerisinde e, bulunan manyetik alan e, yüklü parçacıkları büküyor. Ve e, parçacıklar yükleri ve momentumlarının farklılıklarına göre farklı miktarlarda e, bir dönüş yapıyorlar. Sağ tarafa bakacak olursak orada Atlas deneyindeki silikon takipçisinde bir olay görünümü görüyoruz. Ee, Parçalıkların hepsi farklı miktarlarda bükülmüşler ve farklı izler oluşturmuşlar. Eğer e, şurada sol tarafa e, odaklanacak olursak mesela burada çok fazla parçacık yoğunluğu görüyoruz ve bu e, bizim sadece e, direktörlerimize gördüğümüz şeyler aslında küçük siyah, e, küçük noktalar. Sadece o noktalardan Orada oluşan pek çok parçacık izinin hangi parçaca ait olduğunu e, tekrar oluşturmaya çalışıyoruz aslında biz bu problemde. Sağ, sağ tarafta da görecek olursak e, yatay olarak baktığımızda e, aynı direktörden pek çok parçacık geçiyor. Ve bunların hangi izlerin hangi parçacıklara ait olduğu ve parçacıkların ne yöne gittiğini anlamamız gerekiyor. Bu sayede bir sonraki katmandaki enerji ölçümü yapan e, direktörlere geldiğimizde bu bırakılan enerji hangi parçaca ait bunu çok daha iyi anlayabiliriz. Sonunda sürekli bir geliştirme gayesi var. Her zaman nasıl daha fazla parçacık çarpıştırabiliriz diye düşünüyorlar. Bu sebeple yakın zamanda yüksek ışınımlı bir kadron çarpıştırıcısına geçmek, geçmek için çalışmalar sürüyor şu anda. Ve bununla birlikte artık daha fazla çarpışma meydana gelecek. Ama bununla birlikte dedektörlerin bu veriyi kaydedilmesi için gereken CPU kullanımı miktarları da aşırı derecede artacak. Sol taraftaki grafikte bunun bir tahminini görüyorsunuz. 
Ve şimdi 30 yılı sunumda baktığımızda şu ana kıyasla yani 5-6 katlık bir artış bekleniyor. Bunun sebepleri aslında yani biraz önce bahsettiğim parçacık oluşturma problemi. Bunlardan birisi ama pek çok sebebi var. Parçacık çarpışma miktarı arttığında bunu işlememiz gereken algoritmalar genelde kuadratik veya daha kötü bir scaling'e sahip olduğu için burada ona benzer bir şekilde artışa sahip. Sağ tarafta bu parçacık oluşturma problemi neden daha zorlaşacağını görebiliriz. RAM 1'den RAM 3'e doğru baktığımızda RAM 3 2022-2023'te olacağı beklenen bir çarpıştırma süreci. Ortalama çarpışma sayısı 10 katına çıkması bekleniyor yaklaşık ama çarpışma sayısının yanı sıra direktörde oluşacak bir sayısı 10 kattan daha fazla artacak. Neredeyse 50 kat artması bekleniyor. Bu yüzden bizim bu problem üzerine daha fazla düşünüp bunu hem klasik bilgisayarlarımız çözebiliriz hem de geleceğin teknolojisi dediğimiz kuantum bilgisayarlarla bunu çözebilir miyiz yakın zamanda diye araştırıyoruz. Bu süreci hızlandırmak için son 2018 yılında tamamen halka açık bir makine öğrenmesi yarışması ortaya çıkardı. Bu yarışmada bir simülasyon direktör kurdular ve bu direktörde veri topladılar. Ardından bu veriyi halka açtılar ve insanların makine öğrenmesi algoritmalarıyla bunları öğrenmesini istediler. Sonuçlar çok güzeldi, çok güzel projeler çıktı. Ve e, ardından, e, bu yarışmanın ardından da araştırmacılar e, bu veri setini çok beğendikleri için tekrar kullanmaya devam ettiler ve e, kendi araştırmalarını diğer araştırmacılarla daha rahat karşılaştırabilmek adına bunu bir benchmark e, veri seti olarak kullanmaya başladılar. Veri setine bakacak olursak solda gördüğünüz e, şekle sahip aslında silindirik bir yapı ama şu anda e, y ekseninde r'yi, e, x ekseninde de z'yi görmektesiniz. Bu aslında şöyle yuvarlanmış bir silindir olarak düşünebilirsiniz. Soğan gibi iç içe parçaları var. Biz bu araştırmada diğer araştırmacıların da ilk aşamalarında yaptığı gibi bunun sağ, sağda gördüğünüz kısmını sadece merkez kısmını aldık. Bu sayede e, bizim dedektörümüz e, iç içe geçmiş soğan gibi oluşan bir fıçıyı temsil ediyor aslında. Bütün dedektörlerimiz e, bu fıçının e, şeyleri gibi, kenarları gibi dizilmiş e, bir yapıya sahip. Normalde tre kemal veri setinde 10 bin çarpışmalı verisi var. Biz bunların sadece 100 tanesini kullandık. Bunun neden bu kadar azını kullandığımla ilgili detaylara da gelecek. Şimdi HEPTREGEX projesinden bahsedecek olursam, HEPTREGEX çizgi sinir alıp projesi gerçekleştirdi. Bu bizim tanıdığımız araştırmacıların gerçekleştirdiği ve bizim de baz aldığımız bir araştırma. Ee, orada da bizim yaptığımıza benzer bir şekilde sadece fıçı kısmını kullandılar. Bunun e, sebebini aslında sol alttaki grafikte görmek mümkün. E, sadece bu yatay değil, dikey çizgiler de olduğu zaman e, bizim modellememiz gereken e, bu parçacık izleri çok karmaşıklaşıyor. Mesela şu ortada bulunan yeşil, maviye gitme olasılığı olduğu gibi yukarıya gitme olasılığı da oluyor. E, yeşilin bağlanabileceği çok fazla seçenek olmuş oluyor. Veya aynı şekilde mavi hem ikinci dedektörden e, gelen bir parçaca ait olabiliyor hem de birinci dedektörden gelen bir parça cahit olabiliyor. Dolayısıyla daha karmaşık bir modelin üzerine çalışmamız gerekiyor. Bu yüzden çalışmanın daha ilk aşamasında olduğumuz için biz modeli olabildiğince basit modeline sadece bu ortadaki kısma odaklandık. Sadece ortadaki kısma odaklandığımızda elde ettiğimiz veri de sağda şu an döner ettiği gördüğümüz yapı oluşturuyor aslında bize. Hepsi iç içe geçmiş dedektörler çarpışma sonucunda bize bu şekilde bir görüntü sunuyor. HEPREGEX projesinden sonuçlarından bahsedecek olursak çok güzel sonuçlar gösterdiler. 0.5 kesin değeriyle 99.5 gibi çok güzel doğruluk değerlerine ulaştılar. Ve çalışma mantığı yukarıdaki grafikte kısaca özetlemek gerekirse bir çizgi dediğimiz yapı ilk başta bu modeli sunuluyor. Bir input network ile yüksek bir uzaya aktarılıyor. Ardından düğün ve kenar ağlarıyla defalarca bu veri e, çizgi üzerinde bir makine öğrenmesi yapıyor ve en sonunda da doğru yapıyı, doğru izleri e, bulmayı dilek. Bizim çalışmamızda yapmak istediğimiz kuantum bilgisayarlarda bu algoritmayı nasıl kullanabiliriz, bir avantaj sağlayabilir miyiz size e, araştırmak oldu. E, peki neden kuantum hesaplama? Kuantum hesaplama şu anda aslında henüz e, emekleme aşamasında olan bir alan. E, ama şu anda teorik çalışmalar bize gösteriyor ki, Kuantum hesaplamayla asal çarpanlar ayırma, diner denklem çizimleri ve belki de makine öğrenmesi gibi alanlarda bir avantaj sağlayabiliriz. 
Bu teorik araştırmalarda bize e, şu merak uyandırıyor. Eğer makine öğrenmesinde bir avantaj e, sağlamamız mümkünse bu çok güzel bir şey. Ve kesinlikle bu problemle bize bir avantaj sağlayabilir. E, ve bunun üzerinde e, çalışmalar e, yapıyoruz. E, bu şekilde devam edelim. Kuantum sınıflandırmadan bahsedecek olursak e, bizim aslında e, modelimizin en tabanında bir kuantum sınıflandırma yöntemi yapıyoruz. Burada gördüğünüz bir makale alınmış sonuçlar çok popüler olan en basit veri seti üzerinde bu modelin yine çok basit bir model. Aldığı sonuçları görüyorsunuz. Sıfır devri karşılaşmasının 99 hafta 87'ye kadar çıkabilen doğruluk değerlerini sadece 4 çubikli şu anda kullanabileceğimiz bir kuantum bilgisayar üzerinde gerçekleştirmişler. Ve biz de bu makaledeki modelleri alıp daha karmaşıklaştırarak parça çekiz oluşturma problemini çözmeye çalıştık. Bir kuantum sinir alanı peki nasıl eğitiriz? Farklı olarak diye sorduğumuzda ise e, kuantum devreler kullanıyoruz kuantum bilgisayarlarda. E, ve bu devreyi çalıştırdığımızda, bunu bir neural network gibi düşünebilirsiniz. Bizim sıfır veya bir gibi bir çıktımız var. Fakat sıfır ve bir tek başına bir çıktı bizim için yeterli olmuyor. Çünkü bizim kuantum state dediğimiz, kuantum durumuna gelişmemiz gerekiyor. Bu da ne oluyor? Sıfırla bir arasında aslında bize bir olasılık gerekiyor. Sıfır nokta iki gibi. Bunu elde etmek için de bu devreyi daha önceden belirlediğimiz en kere çalıştırıyoruz. Ve e, onların ortalamasını alarak bir sonuç elde ediyoruz. Ardından e, referans yerine bakarak bir hata hesaplayıp bu hata fonksiyonu üzerinden de parametrelerimizi e, güncelleyerek tekrar tekrar bu işlemi tekrarlayıp en sonunda modeli e, öğrenmeyi elde ediyoruz. Verimize tekrar dönecek olursak e, bir e, silindirik yapı göstermiştim size. Bu tek başına e, GPU'lara sığması e, zor olan ve e, CPU kullanımında yani çok fazla e, hafıza ihtiyacı doğuran e, bir veri aslında. Bu yüzden bunu biz toplam 16 parçaya böldük ve sağda görebileceğiniz şekle ulaştık. E, bunu yapmamızda herhangi bir sakınca yok çünkü biz şunu biliyoruz, e, parçacıklar e, fizik dışı hareketlerde bulunmuyorlar. Bir anda X yönüne giderken yönlerini e, değiştirip Y yönüne veya X X yönüne gitmeye başlamıyorlar. Dolayısıyla bizim çizgilerimiz aslında direct tıkla diyebileceğimiz, yani yönlendirilmiş çizgiler. Dolayısıyla biz e, bu yuvarlak yapıyı parçaları alabiliyoruz. Tabii ki parçaladığımız kısımlarda kayıplar mevcut. Ama şu anda biz olabildiğince basit bir modelle bu problemi ant bilgisayarda çözmeye çalıştığımız için buradaki kayıpları şimdilik yok sayıyoruz. E, bu veriye yine bir takım kesitler, kesimler uyguluyoruz. Bu kesimler nedir? Momentumu çok düşük olmasın parçacığın. Momentumu düşük olduğunda parçacıklar çok fazla güçlebiliyorlar. Bu yine bizim kesimde bizi engellememiz için bunu engelliyoruz. Yine iki direktör arasında çok yüksek açılara sahip olmaması için belirli seçimler uyguluyoruz. Ardından 100 olaydan toplam 1600 tane çizgi elde etmiş oluyoruz. Ve bunun, bu çizgilerin 3 eksen, 3 sinir eksen dağılımını aşağıda görebilirsiniz. Bunların hepsini şimdi bir araya koyduğumuzda biz e, bu modeli e, bir kuantum çizgi sinir ağı dediğimiz yapıda çalıştırıyoruz. Bunun içerisinde kenar ağı ve düğüm ağı var. Ve bu ağların içerisinde hibrit sinir ağı dediğimiz yapılar var. Bu e, hibrit sinir ağları iki ana mantıkla oluşuyor. Birincisi veri yükleme devresi. E, bizim klasik veri kuantum bilgisayar yüklememizi sağlıyor. İkincisi parametrize edilmiş kuantum devre dediğimiz e, klasik sinir ağlarında olduğu gibi e, parametrelerin kontrol edildiğimiz modeller. Bunları kullanarak kenar ve düğüm ağına çalıştırıyoruz. E, bu çalışmada toplam 3 farklı devre modeli kullandık. Bunlar bizim e, tasarladığımız devreler değil, literatürde olan devreler. Ve bunların karşılaştırmalarını sunduk. Kenar e, ne yaptığına tekrar e, dönecek olursak, kenar ağı düğümler arasındaki kenarların e, özelliklerini öğrenmeye çalışıyor. Bu kenarın gerçekten e, bu iki düğümü bağlayıp bağlamadığını öğrenmeye çalışıyor. Düğüm ağı ise üçlü düğümlerin üzerinden işlem yapıp e, düğümlerin yüksek e, gizli uzaylardaki bilgilerini öğrenmeye çalışıyor. Ardından biz bu kenar ve düğüm ağlarını defalarca çalıştırarak e, en alt direktördeki düğüm bilgisini en üst direktördeki düğüm bilgisine aktarmaya çalışıyoruz ve bu sayede modelin daha e, yani bütün veriye yayılarak bir öğrenme yapmasını sağlamak e, Öğrenim sonuçlarımıza bakacak olursak 3 e, farklı devlet için sonuçlarımız mevcut. MPS'nin e, soldaki kayıp fonu kayıt e, grafiğine baktığımızda en kötü e, sonucu aldığını nerede en iyi sonucu aldığını biliyoruz. Bunun e, en basit söyleyebileceğim sebebi e, devrelerin karmaşıklığı. Mevra, mera devresi daha e, fazla parametreyle daha karmaşık bir yapıya sahip. Dolayısıyla e, bu sonucu 
olduğunu veriyor bize. Bu da bize şunu gösteriyor. E, farklı devreleri seçerek e, sonucumuzu da iyileştirebiliriz. E, bu sonuçların e, klasik heptrekex modelinden bahsediyorum. Ona karşılaştırmasına baktığımızda Mera ile heptrekex projesine çok yaklaşabildiğimizi görebiliyoruz. E, bu da bize şunun için bir umut veriyor. Eğer e, modelimizde bazı noktaları değiştirirsek, bir takım iyileştirmeler yaparsak klasik modelle aynı sonucu, hatta belki de daha iyi sonucu elde edebiliriz. Bununla ilgili nasıl geliştirebiliriz kısmındayız. Çok büyük küçük bir çalışmamız oldu. E, modelin diğer parametreleriyle oynadığımızda e, losu iyileştirebildiğimizi, daha iyi e, sonuçları elde edebildiğimizi gördük. Sonuçları özetleyecek olursak, e, bu çalışmada klasik modele yakın bir performans sahip bir e, quantum model oluşturduk. E, bu model şu anda e, klasikten daha iyi olmasa da gelecek geliştirmelerle daha iyi performans sunması mümkün olabilir. E, biz bunu düşünüyoruz. Bu iyileştirmeleri yapmak için e, dört tane e, madde düşünüyoruz. Birincisi yineleme sayısını arttırması. E, düğüm ve e, kenar ağlarının yinelenmesinden bahsetmiştim. Bunlar defalarca çalışıyordu. Bunun arttırılması. Gizli uzay boyutunun arttırılması. Farklı farklı devre modellerinin test edilmesi. Ve e, sadece yüz olay kullanmıştık. Daha fazla devrin kullanmasıyla bu sonuçların daha iyi olacağını düşünüyoruz. Ama bunların önünde e, bizim için tek bir engel var. Bunun sebebi ise kuantum devre simülasyonunun çok yavaş çalışması. Bu çalışmada 8-12 kilitlik devreler kullandık ama bunlar e, bu çalışmada gördüğünüz her bir modelin e, bir bir kopu çalışması bizim serverlarımızda bir hafta gibi bir süre alıyor. E, bunlar tabii simülasyon olduğu için bu kadar e, fazla zaman alıyor ama bunu iyileştirme üzerinde bir çalışmalarımız devam ediyor. E, konuşmamı bitirmeden e, katkıda bulunan araştırmacılarıma teşekkür etmek istiyorum e, ve e, beraber işbirliği yaptığımız konuları da burada görebilirsiniz. E, teşekkür ederim. Bu kaynaklardan bana ulaşıp sorularınızı da yöneltebilirsiniz. Ayrıca bu çalışmanın bütün kodlarını aşağıda verdiğim kitap adresinden de inceleyebilirsiniz. Teşekkür ederim. We thank Cenk very much for sharing us this important work with a lot of important collaborators. It was an excellent presentation and excellent work. Let's just check to see whether we have some uh, questions. Uh, I guess we don't have uh, uh, any questions. I mean, if you have uh, further comments, you can uh, quickly uh, do uh, your comments. Uh, and uh, I thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, actually learned uh, quite a lot from your presentation. Uh, uh, we used to have a grid computing uh, like uh, 10, 15 years ago and a uh, large uh, hadron collider data was being processed on the grid. So we now have uh, different approaches uh, on quantum computing. So it was very, let's say, informative uh, for us. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. So we will move to our next uh, uh, presentation. Uh, let me just check. Uh, it's uh, adaptation of consensus algorithm on a blockchain-based uh, P2P energy trading platform. Uh, the presenter will be uh, Mert Ilici from Hacettepe University. Let me just start the video. Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. My name is Matt Bilici and I study at Clean and Renewable Energy Sources Master Program at Hacettepe University. My advisor for this project was Mr. Adnan Özsoy from the Department of Computer Engineering at Hacettepe University. My submission topic is adaptation of consensus algorithm on a blockchain-based peer-to-peer energy trading platform. My motivation for this project began when I first learned about the blockchain applications in energy trade area. And I indeed saw that blockchain can be securely used to trade energy. Energy production from the renewable energy is on a high rise and there is a demand for more and more renewable energy. In 2018, 26.2 of the total global energy generation was sourced by renewable energies. And 
by 2040, this number is expected to rise to 45%. So most of the production from these renewable energy sources are wind and solar energies, and they are still on a rise. And they are very dependent on climate. So they can change from morning to evening. So a good solution to securely and effectively use these renewable energies is trading them. Energy trading today is done by centralized solutions run by governments that trade energy on a local and national level. But blockchain-based solutions for the energy trade provide a new approach to this problem. They provide trustless and decentralized energy trading platforms, and they maximize the revenue for both government the producers of electricity and the consumers of electricity. So blockchain-based energy platforms can offer a brand new solution when there are microgrids and electric vehicles connected to a network. But there is a problem with this blockchain-based energy trading platforms, and that is the energy efficiency. And the energy efficiency problem is mostly based on the consensus algorithm, as people are solving computer puzzles to reach a validation and create blocks. And a huge amount of energy is wasted just to operate the system. When I done a literature review on the topic, I saw that some research groups in different parts of the world tried using blockchain to trade energy and indeed showed that blockchain technology can be used for securely trading energy while keeping privacy and security of people in a trustless manner. But the problem with this work is that none of them addresses the energy efficiency of the blockchain system that they use. While trading energy, we are at the same time wasting our energy just to trade our energy and we are going to a lower energy efficiency. And I saw that there is one project in Ireland going on to simulate a blockchain technology-based energy trading platform with real homes. And their research is expected to finish this year and to show that blockchain can actually be used in a microgrid. The main problem I realized in the literature is that the energy efficiency of the consensus algorithm was very low. As you know, Bitcoin requires a lot of energy to mine. And today, when we accept Bitcoin as a country, the Bitcoin system as a network is a huge consumer of electricity. Indeed, it is after Czech Republic and Chile. It consumes more energy like a mid-sized country. And this is a huge problem while trading energy. So this problem needs to be addressed. At the same time, the privacy of the nodes that use the energy data should be encrypted so that people's personal data cannot be used by companies. And the system should be attack proof so that the safety of the system is always ensured and the energy trade is always continuous. Uh, when we check the energy needed to create a one dollar worth of uh, goods, uh, the cryptocurrencies are today uh, are very high compared to the classical methods of uh, creating goods. Uh, the rare earth metals is the highest uh, one that we classically use, and it is only nine million joules for a dollar, but. For Bitcoin, this number is 19, so uh, it, there is a huge gap between their energy consumption. And this problem needs to be addressed, especially if you're trying to trade energy with it. Uh, when I checked the literature, I found that most of the studies use a proof of work algorithm, but some of them managed to adjust it uh, so that the computer puzzle is easier to solve and easier to simulate. Uh, 
to see better results about uh, the general implication of the study, uh, blockchain. These studies are very important, but they still lack the uh, concept of trying to uh, reduce the energy consumption of the systems. Uh, there are uh, other approaches like proof of stake and proof of identity, uh, but uh, these limit the blockchain uh, to people who wants to uh, consider this as a way to uh, make up their lives. So this uh, does not actually prove a very scalable and uh, decentralized solution. We still need an authority to uh, validate the identities of people. In a similar attempt I saw was in a different article uh, that focuses on methods to reduce energy consumption in blockchain. Uh, here it, they show that uh, delegated proof of stake is the fastest and most uh, energy efficient version. Uh, but here uh, the implication is not uh, specially uh, recognized for energy trading, but for all blockchain applications. Uh, so, this study does not actually produce an actual uh, solution to how to trade energy with delegated proof of stake. So, uh, there was a need uh, for a new method on this area. Uh, I tried to develop the method by uh, making the assumptions that smart meters are uh, available and are established on homes. And there are no legal terms in the country that uh, is being used like banning trade of electricity between uh, the consumers and prosumers. And there should be legal terms that uh, government uh, does not prevent any uh, attempts to use blockchain on energy trade. And there needs to be a transparent uh, buy-sell price from the central authority, in case most of the time it's the government. Uh, and there needs to be microgrids that are established and can communicate within uh, the producers and consumers of the system. And for the system to work sustainably, the local production should be more or less equal to the local consumption so that people can trade their energy with uh, close by uh, local neighbors. And there needs to be a physical connection with other microgrids and base stations, but it should be limited. Uh, with these assumptions, I have come up with a new consensus algorithm that makes use of green energy production. I call it uh, proof of green energy. Uh, the system uses Ethereum-based smart contracts to uh, validate the blocks and trade energy. Uh, here, uh, there are smart meters connected to the internet on each node that is a prosumer or consumer of electricity. And the system autonomously and in a smart way uh, trades the energy uh, with the uh, local microgrid uh, to a company for the needs of the house. Uh, and the connection here, the connection uh, with the other microgrids and the base plants are limited, as you can see on the schematic, uh, because uh, there needs to be more prosumers than consumers in the network so that we don't need to buy energy from outside sources as much uh, except for some extreme cases we should be able to make the production uh, consumed in the same network uh, the proof of green energy method uses three different smart contracts uh, the first contract works as a trader one and any node of the network can initiate this contract. Uh, this contract buys energy when the house needs one and sells the energy when the renewable energy production is excess. Uh, here's a lower limit for the price uh, so that the revenue of the uh, node is maximized. It is the government's buy price of the electricity. And there is an upper limit for this. And it is the government's sell price so that nobody buys electricity at a higher place than government. And during this uh, trade contract, the information regarding the trade, uh, like the seller and the buyer and their relevant balances before and after the trade is saved on a block. 
Uh, and then the next contract is triggered automatically after uh, a creation of a block. And the energy flow counter starts and it first uh, creates a PGP based public private key pair uh, to protect the personal data of nodes. Key is transferred to all nodes and the smart meter in the node uh, protects and keeps this public key. And this public key is then later used by the smart meter to encrypt the energy data, both production and consumption. And then the production data is encrypted and sent back to the next country. This way, the privacy of uh, the personal data about your energy consumption and the hours and the amounts of energy you're uh, producing and consuming is uh, privately held within the system. And then this contract is completed when the energy data is sent to the last contract, where a validator is assigned. Uh, here, uh, the, the contract has a 10 minute timer to wait uh, for a competitive uh, time. And the energy production amounts uh, are then decrypted here with the uh, private key uh, of the previous contract. And then the energy production amounts within that neighborhood is sorted. Uh, the node with the most green energy production is assigned as the validator so that they do, nobody needs to solve a, a computer puzzle, but the one with the most renewable energy production is automatically assigned as the validator. And the contract may also wait for an arbitrary time for equality of the nodes uh, so that they can all uh, assign to a uh, validator uh, place if they have the production. Uh, after the validations are assigned and the blocks are created, a block reward is sent to the person with the most energy production in that microgrid and in that neighborhood. Uh, results show that this model uh, resolves the energy efficiency challenge of the blockchain energy trade platforms because the validation system here uses very little energy. It is basically a small decryption and sorting algorithm, but creates a huge output for the network uh, here, the personal data of the nodes are all encrypted, and it is new to non-classical attacks as PGP keys are not uh, easily sold within a 10 minute period. And the system also provides a uh, reward for the highest renewable energy production, so that this also makes sure that people are trying to uh, produce more energy to get more rewards. Uh, here, the energy trade is completed without the centralized authority or the need for a government. Uh, this way, the revenue is maximized in both buying and selling phases. And the trade information is immutably registered in the network. Uh, these are the references I used in my article, and these are the references I used in my slides. Thank you for listening. So we thank the speaker for, for the nice talk about uh, blockchain uh, applications in the energy industries. Uh, uh, let me check if there are some uh, uh, questions. Uh, there are no uh, questions uh, and we are also running a little bit uh, late. So, I mean, if the participants have further questions, so they can contact uh, the, the speaker also. Uh, I'm going to move to the next uh, Talk uh, uh, quickly since we are running a uh, little bit late. So the next talk. Uh, is about uh, quantum graph neural networks. Uh, it will be present. Uh, sorry, let me just a second.
I keep on the wrong video. So the next talk is about uh, deep learning approach to fault detection and classification in data centers. It will be presented by Delphus Mubavir uh, uh, from Istanbul Technical University. Just a second. Hello everyone, and welcome to my presentation. Just uh, one minute. Uh, Hello everyone, and welcome to my presentation for the Bashagun 2020 High Performance Computing Conference. My name is Dalton Squawi, and the paper I'll be presenting to you right now was co-authored by Professor Hamza Sali Elden and Professor Bejet Utorei on the topic, a deep learning approach to fraud detection and classification in data centers. Here is a presentation outline that I am going to follow from the start to the finish of this presentation. So I'm going to begin to give you an introduction of what is happening currently in data centers so that you have a grasp of exactly what we'll be trying to solve with our paper. I will move forward to vividly state the problem statement what we are trying to, to, to accomplish. Then I would move to the objectives whereby I would state the hypothesis which we based our work on. Then the methodology would briefly follow to state the techniques that we applied in order to solve the problem which I stated or which we stated in the problem statement. Then I would present the results and the discussions of what we achieved at the end of the implementation of this research. Then I would close this presentation with a conclusion. So to begin with, we all know that data centers are at the heart of the IT industry today. They are driving cloud computing processing storage and performing cloud-based applications for multi-million corporations such as google facebook banking services telecommunication industry in fact data centers are mission critical computing infrastructures that actually bear a significant amount of cost and is growing at a prolific rate research shows that in 2017, uh, data center infrastructure surpassed the $40 billion mark. And it was forecasted that between 2018 and 2024, that there would be a 10% rise in the compound annual growth rate of data center infrastructure worldwide. Now, the increase in these cloud computing services and cloud-based applications on data centers has led to a worldwide increase in the electricity consumption by these data centers. Research shows that, which was performed in 2010, shows that about 1.1 to 1.5% of the electricity in the whole world is consumed by data centers. Now, another research goes to prove that in 2018, 
205 terawatt hour of electricity is consumed by data centers in the globe. Now, this increase in energy consumption has led to an awakening of energy reduction by data center operators and manufacturers. They now try to run the cooling mechanical system at lower temperatures, which push the servers in the data centers to be operated at temperatures that are slightly higher than the temperatures that they were designed for. These higher operating temperatures has significant impact in the probability of equipment failure. Now, data centers being at the heart of IT industries, if equipment fail, this can be a huge catastrophic loss, both financially and economically. Now, our problem statement in this research is to find out how exactly can we leverage artificial intelligence based models together with infrared thermography in order to detect the data center status, ensuring that data centers operate at a higher reliability rate and have a high energy efficiency. So this led us to our objective and our objective was to try and design a deep convolutional neural network that is actually capable of detecting and classifying five server operation states. The first step is to detect when the server is running at a 60% load capacity. The second step is when to detect the server running at a 100% capacity. The third state, if, if there is a main fact failure of the server, we should be able to detect it. The fourth state is when there is a CPU fan failure, or when it kind of stops running. So, and in the final state we were trying to detect in this research is if there is any blockage at the server entrance. Now, this led us to come up with this implementation strategy. First, we needed images. So we needed infrared thermal images of data centers operating at all of these five states. Luckily, research that was performed by the original authors of this, um, of this work who used different techniques. They supplied us 1,370 1, thermal images of both made up of 90, each of the different states made up of 90 um, thermal images. So by using this thermal image uh, data set that we had, we performed a basic data set pre-processing technique, which was simply cropping the images so that we have exactly just the information where the server lies on the server yard. Then we perform data augmentation, of course, the data set with just 1,270 images was quite small. So by implementing data augmentation, we were able to boost the performance accuracy of the models that we implemented. So the final step involved us to implement three models. The first model was a single convolutional layer deep learning model. The second model was a CNN that had two convolutional layers. And finally, the third model that we implemented, we tested the concept of transfer learning by using pre-trained weights of the mobile net version to architecture. This was now able to output to us the server operating at any of these five states. Now, by implementing this schematic, here are the results that we got. So on this first column, you can find four graphs. So the first graph is the training loss that we obtain for the single layer convolutional neural network. The second is the training accuracy. The third is the validation loss. The fourth is the validation accuracy. It is the same. This graph in the middle shows those same training and 
validation, loss, and accuracy for its two uh, convolutional neural network architecture. Last model is the graph. It shows the graphs of the mobile net mention to uh, network that we build. So to give more detailed results of the percentages and the performance, we saw that using a very basic convolutional neural network with just a single convolutional neural layer, we obtained the best validation accuracy of 98% as we can see on this table. So here is the validation accuracy using the two convolutional neural network uh, model and that using transfer learning. So now it should be noted here that the authors have really are uh, they actually achieved a 91% accuracy using this same data set. However, what they implemented was they did some pre-processing and image processing techniques and then applied support vector machine to in order to have this. So you can see that there is a huge boost in terms of performance accuracy based on our results and the results that were obtained by previous authors. So finally, we were able to conclude that our deep learning approach obtained a, a better accuracy of 98% using just a single convolutional neural network compared to the 91% obtained by Hangui AI. Now, it is clearly evident to us all now that infrared demography coupled with deep learning can actually have a role in the energy efficiency and energy reliability of data centers. Now, given these insights, we all know that thermal uh, imaging technology is quite a new concept and you know, incorporating it in deep learning and putting this in data centers is still at its infancy. So, me and the co-authors, Professor Hamza and Professor Benjamin Bo, we are planning on performing more and more experiments, conducting field tests in order and using more efficient learning environment to see where this work is going to take us. So I have come to the end of my presentation and I would like to thank you all for your time and thank you very much for listening. We also thank uh, Beltus uh, for his uh, excellent talk. Uh, data center uh, energy efficiency is very important topic for high performing computing. So thank, thank you very thank much, you very much uh, for uh, providing uh, his uh, and their team's uh, uh, important results in this area. So we have come to the end of our session. Uh, there is, a, I think, one uh, question maybe there. Okay, so could you please answer the question quickly and then we will uh, end the session because we are a little bit late. Uh, uh, why the validation loss is less than the training loss? Is it a sign of uh, overfitting? So this is the question. Okay. Fatsi shall thank you very much for that question. Actually, um, validation loss, validation loss being less than the training loss actually isn't a sign of um, overfeeding. So as you can see, when we train the model, if if you look at the, the results that we obtained, you would find that the model, the results we had for like the um, when we apply the, the the when we train the data with with uh, the mobile net version two uh, architecture, you would realize that the accuracy we got was actually slightly less than the accuracy we got with the other two models. So we can clearly see that this was due to the fact that the training data that we had was not sufficient enough, and these models are actually very deep, so they kind of memorized the um, mobile net version to memorize this data and perform um, badly because the training data was less for it to generalize well. But the other models were 
you could easily learn the basic facts without memorizing the data. Hence, they obtain the better validation loss and better validation accuracy. So um, I don't know if I have answered your question well, Fadisha. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, we will end this uh, session. Uh, so thank you very much uh, again, uh, in particular uh, to all the speakers. Uh, we thank them for presenting their uh, works. So uh, let's move on to the next uh, session. Uh, we are a little bit uh, late. So uh, goodbye to everyone. Goodbye, Professor.